Welcome to Pine Bluff, Arkansas, where the hometown Golden Lions are led by a sensational senior wide receiver on offense and a... Welcome to Pine Bluff, Arkansas, where the hometown Golden Lions are led by a sensational senior wide receiver on offense and a true freshman linebacker on defense. Tonight, they face the preseason Offensive Player of the Year, quarterback K.J. Black and the defending league champion Prairie View Panthers. It's Swag Football, and it's next on The U. Welcome to Pine Bluff, Arkansas for ESPNU College Football Primetime presented by McDonald's. We're at Golden Lions Stadium on the campus of Arkansas Pine Bluff for this key SWAC Western Division battle as the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff takes on the defending SWAC champs, Prairie View. Let's check out the SWAC standings. Everyone trying to keep pace with Grambling in the West. They're on top, unbeaten at 3-0. Prairie View is in third. Arkansas Pine Bluff is in fourth. Hello, everyone. I'm Charlie Neal, and throughout the evening, I'll be bringing you updates on what's happening in black college football but this game is a story of two quarterbacks we're talking about josh boudreau of pine bluff the swack offensive player of the week and kj black the preseason player of the year in the southwestern athletic conference the question tonight for prairie view is how effective kj black will be he missed the first two games of the season with a knee injury and he's still not 100 percent for more on kj black and the rest of tonight's action let's throw it up to the guys who are going to be calling the game anish roff and jay walker gentlemen all right, thank you, Charlie. And K.J. Black, he's not 100%. Coaches put him at about 70%, say he won't get to even 85% before the season's over. But they need him to be closer to what he was a year ago if they have any hope of repeating his SWAC champs. Yeah, you can't do anything about his physical well-being, but what they're more concerned about is the timing with the wide receivers, the time missed during the offseason and getting that timing pattern down. This is a rhythm offense, and they really rely on K.J. Black to make the right decisions with the football using his mobility as well as his decision-making. Meanwhile, for Arkansas, Pine Bluff, all the attention on number 86, Raymond Weber. He's Josh Boudreaux's favorite target. Boudreaux has 80 completions, 40 of them to Weber. Yeah, we know what Josh Boudreaux can do, but more impressive is what Raymond Weber's been able to do. The question for Prairie View A&M tonight is going to be, how do you eliminate his touches? And if he does ca make catches on you, how do you get that average down? Every time he touches the football, he averages a first down per touch. That's the question tonight. Weber has six touchdowns in his last two games. Coming up, we'll meet a miracle worker and a three-time Super Bowl champ. Plus, it's Professor Jay with his lesson plan for tonight's game. Welcome to Golden Lion Stadium here in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, alongside Jay Walker and East Shroff, a key battle in the SWAC West tonight. And let's meet the coaches. Henry Frazier, you can say he's a miracle worker, took this Prairie View program from the Dark Ages into the Renaissance in 07, led this team to its first winning season since 1976. They won the SWAC title a year ago. And, Jay, what's your lesson plan for the Panthers to have success tonight? Well, the Panthers, they have to get pass happy. Unleash K.J. Black and the wide receiver and uh, group. We're waiting to see them make their 2010 appearance. In defensive, they've got to be secondary strong. In their secondary defense, they must find ways to stop Raymond Weber from doing any damage. You might remember Monte Coleman, if you're a Redskins fan, played 16 years for Washington, won three Super Bowls with the Skins, a former standout at Central Arkansas, now in his third season as Arkansas Pine Bluff head coach. Jay, what do the Golden Lions have to do in order to be successful in this game? Well, well Prairie View a is going to try and stop Raymond Weber. You've got to come up with creative ways for him to get his touches. They don't all have to be receiving yards, but get him the ball in space so he can make some plays. And defensively, they must put pressure on the Prairie View a quarterback. That's K.J. Black. you got a quarterback with a bad wheel. Put some pressure on him in the middle. Force him to run. We're ready for the opening kick. A line drive kick by Pedro Ventura. It's taken at the 30-yard line. And up across the 40-yard line, good starting field position for Arkansas Pine Bluff. And we get to look at Josh Boudreau. That was Nick Young who took that kickoff. And Josh Boudreau coming off a terrific game last week. 24 of 29, 366 yards, four touchdowns at a school record for completions and pass yards. That was against Southern. And that was in Louisiana in front of a lot of his friends and family. He's a kid from Baton Rouge. Over. 
Boudreaux to the air, and there's number 86, Raymond Weber. And we saw that again, a quick little out to Weber, and yards after catch, that's what he's so good at. All right, let's look at the Arkansas Pine Bluff offense. Adrian Moore is the starting tailback at 176 yards of total offense in a game against Alabama State, including 99 yards rushing, and we're going to call Raymond Weber's name quite a bit in this ball game. It's another first down for Arkansas Pine Bluff, and it's Boudreaux again to the air, and again to Weber. He juggles and catches it across the 40-yard line, gain of four yards on the play, and Weber, Weber on first down, and first down again. You know, what we talked about was the fact that is he as good as advertising? Right away, they're sticking to the lesson plan, figuring out ways to get him the football. One was just a six-yard hitch route, let him turn around, make things happen in space. Then they get him with the wide receiver screen. And I like what they're doing offensively. It's just number count. You know, they're going to have two receivers line up on that side of the ball. And if Prairie View only goes two on two, then they're going to continue to go to that side of the football. On second down, it's a run. and. Not much, so it'll bring up a third down. And let's check out this Prairie View A&M defense. This Panther defensive front is anchored by number 90, Quinton Spears. He's a potential next-level player, recruited as a wide receiver. Got a slender bill, 6'4", 240. But coaches say he can run, run, and run. Meanwhile, the linebackers led by Max Century. He's a fifth-year senior. 51, rather 31 tackles on the season. Also a smart kid, even though he's undersized. They're saying he could go to med school next year. Four receiver set here for Arkansas Pine Bluff on third and four. Boudreaux under pressure, and he throws it over the head of his intended receiver, Chris Bolton. And it's fourth down from the... 38-yard line, it looks like it's going to be the punting unit coming on. Well, we talk about bringing some pressure there. From that last play there, they brought the inside linebacker, the outside linebacker. That's what you call a kitchen sink blitz. Seven guys trying to get to the quarterback. Two of them got through, made the hit, forcing Boudreaux to make an inaccurate pass. Kent Black at his own 47-yard line. He'll punt it away. Spencer Nelson back deep for Prairie View. This one bounces out of bounds, and it'll be Prairie View football here with 13.03 to go in the first quarter. They'll have the ball at their own 10-yard line, and we get a look at K.J. Black, a dynamic player, one of the best quarterbacks in all of the FCS coming into the season, and he's really the leader of this Prairie View offense and a big part of why they won a SWAC title a year ago. And what he was able to do last season was remarkable. I mean, this is the kid that was a transfer from Western Kentucky. Normally, when you transfer to a new conference, it takes you a year to kind of learn your way around it. He got it done right away and led his team to a SWAC championship. Missed the first two games after hurting his knee in the spring, and he's slowly and slowly rounding into form. From his own 10, Black with time. That's a quick screen to Donald Babers, and he is wrapped up behind the line of scrimmage. Might have gotten no gain just due to forward progress. Brandon Thurmond on the stop. And looking at that Prairie View AM offense, Babers should get a heavy workload in his last game. 26 carries, 151 yards, two touchdowns. That offensive line, especially on that left side, Tim Tussey and James Diekel. Those two guys were all conference a year ago. If they're going to run, expect to see a lot of runs on that left side. Second down and 10, no gain on first down. It's Babers. He finds a hole, and he's got a first down for Prairie View, a gain of 13 yards on the play. Yeah, th this is what they want to see right now. So they finally got their center, number 50. Stoney Owens is back. He's in there making a good seal block, getting to the second level. Good job there. And, you know, we put a lot of pressure on K.J. Black and his numbers. Well, Donald Babers' numbers are down from a season ago as well. He's only averaging three yards a carry. They need for him to produce more, and if you can get the running game going, it's only going to help your quarterback in the passing game. Empty backfield, five wide receivers here on first down from the 23. Black steps up, and he goes down. 
That's a sack. It's Ibrahim Abdullahi. We're going to be saying his name a lot. A loss of seven yards on the play. He really makes this Golden Lion defense go. Yeah, from the nose tackle position. Anytime you can get quarterback pressure with an interior lineman, that's a plus for your defense. And you see Ibrahim Abdullahi. They call him Hero. Hero. And you see why he's a hero playing like one today. And, you know, the moment we got to practice yesterday, we saw NFL scouts lying in the sideline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who are you here to see? Weber and Hero. Yeah. And he's a guy that they say can very easily transfer his skills to the next level. We saw a scout from the Colts, a scout from the Seahawks. Black under center this time on second and long. It's Babers around the right side, but he doesn't exactly get around the right side. Another loss on the play. It'll bring up third and long. And let's take a look at this Arkansas Pine Bluff defense. We told you about Abdullah. He's also on the track team, a shot and discus guy. And again, NFL scouts. He's got their attention. As for the linebacking crew, Jerian Harris, a true freshman, leads the SWAC in tackles per game. And watch out for Giovanni Harvey. They might be picking on him. He's the third left corner for this Golden Lion secondary. Joe Brown, the original starter, towards ACL in the fall, and James Maxwell towards ACL last week. On third and long, here's the blitz. And it's batted down. That was Jerian Harris getting into the backfield, and he came in completely unblocked and batted that ball down. Yeah, I mean, they didn't even disguise this blitz. He's coming there uncovered on the outside, and this is what you want to have, one of your hot reads. And the moment the quarterback releases, if you can't get to him, leave your feet. And I think a more mobile quarterback like K.J. Black normally will pump that ball, go around him, and make a big play. But when you're relying on staying in the pocket, you have to try and get rid of it. But what an athletic play by Jerian Harris, the freshman. Pedro Ventura, the senior, kicks it away. Good kick by Ventura. Backpedaling to his own 30 is Trey Austin. And he gets a pretty decent return out across the 40-yard line. And Arkansas Pine Bluff will have good field position again. They'll get the ball for the second time when we come back. Scoreless so far in the first half. Telecast is presented in high definition on ESPN UHD by Comcast. We're scoreless here in the first quarter in Pine Bluff. Both teams punted on their first two drives. And we remind you that coverage of ESPN Rise High School Football continues Friday night on ESPN. You see the future stars of football today. ESPN Rise High School Football Showcase presented by the U.S. Marines on ESPNU Friday at 8 Eastern. Well, we get our second look at this Arkansas Pine Bluff offense. Got a first down on their first drive and then had to punt. And under center is Josh Boudreau. Four wide receivers set on first down. Low snap, and it's taken by Adrian Moore, and he's gobbled up behind the line of scrimmage. Lester Butler gets in on the tackle, a loss of four on the play. You know, when you got one of these plays right here, what can you do? The timing is all disrupted. Gone to the wrong man, actually. And a great job of recognition by Moore. Picking up that ball and trying to make something out of nothing. That's something you can't have. It seems like in college football this year, we've seen so many bad snaps, whether it's Florida or some of the other schools just snapping the ball on the ground. Is it that hard to snap shotgun? I wouldn't know. Well, you know, we saw even the Florida Gators in their first game against Miami of Ohio, a lot of issues getting the ball from center. Uh, to John Brantley, Christopher Wilson, the center on this Arkansas Pine Bluff football team. He's a sophomore. Boudreau finds Weber, turns, gets a field, and boy, that's twice now. Yards after catch. That's his specialty. John Mark Henderson transferred from Syracuse last October in on the stop. You know, Weber's got that shake, and the good thing about Weber is, you know, you have guys that can catch balls all over the field, but it's the ones that can separate from the defender. Those are what you call go-to targets. That's your go-to wide receiver, somebody that can separate initially from the line of scrimmage, whereas a quarterback, you're not forced to make a perfect throw every time. And you see every time the ball's going his way, he's got plenty of separation between himself and the defensive back. Weber already has three catches in this ball game. He's lined up at the bottom of your screen. Boudreaux being chased, and he goes down. A big sack by Prairie View. 
Quentin Spears. He's their fierce pass rusher on the defensive front. And it's going to bring up third and very long, or make that fourth and very long, as it was a loss of 19 on that play. And, boy, you saw him eyeballing Raymond Weber, and Weber wasn't open. Yeah, and I think they were trying to set up a screen underneath, and the timing was wrong. The right side of the line gave a quick release to the defensive line. The left side held their blockers a little firm, and they were trying to get the screen to Moore. Couldn't do it. Spears stayed all over the quarterback, and Drew didn't even have time to throw the ball away. Kent Black to punt it away. There's a flag on the play. Spencer Nelson fields inside his own 40. Goes right up the middle. A good breaks a tackle. He's across midfield. And he is down into Pine Bluff territory, close to the 40-yard line. And Prairie View will have some good starting field position when we come back. But before we go to break, we have a penalty. And the flag was thrown right as the ball was snapped. Yeah, that's got to be on Arkansas Pine Bluff. Looks like they're doing like Canadian Football League. They've got a guy going in motion, and he's going forward towards the line of scrimmage before the ball is snapped. They got away with it the first time. See, they're calling that a shift. They call that. George McCollum is the head referee. So an illegal shift against uh, Arkansas Pine Bluff and Prairie View declining the penalty after a solid punt return there by Spencer Nelson. And Monty Coleman not happy with his uh, special teams right there. Not so much the flag. I think it was more the punt coverage. I, I agree with you there. And, you know, it's something about when you've got defensive coaches, defensive players are going to be head coaches. You know, they don't put up with those penalties, those stupid penalties, especially when you're talking about on punt coverage. Black from his own 41. Guy open. Man open over the middle, and he overshot him. That was Donald Law the third, the intended receiver, his tight end. Wow. I mean, you can't draw it up any easier than this. Cover two formation. You've got your tight end running right down the middle of the field, coming right to your living room. Just get that ball down. Oh, he's wide open with nobody behind him, and he missed a big target. Donald Law, 6'5". 6'5", so, 270, but again, the tight end, not really an integral part of this Panther offense. Law, just one catch coming into the game. Cover two, tight end's a part of the offense. Middle of the field, wide open, tight end should become the offense, and he was open there. It's just a poor throw by K.J. Black. And said it's uh, second down and 10. Black, handoff, and solid game there on second down of five yards. Jermaine Graham making the stop Donald Babers on the run and it'll bring up a third and five and a quick correction that penalty was tacked on to the end of the play so it wasn't declined it was tacked on to the end of the play that was the penalty on the punt return right now third down you know any offense that's struggling and you got an offense like Prairie View's only averaging 17 points a game normally if you look at their third down conversion rates it'll tell you the type of offense that they've had 25 percent coming into the game and that's why they're at 17 points a game yeah, they were at 29.4 a year ago black on third and six throws and it's caught by michael benson and he's got some space and he gets a first down inside the 20. Raymond Duplachain making the stop, and he also got a nice block from one of his fellow receivers downfield. And this is why he, KJ Black was the offensive player of the year in the swag last year. Look at that. Crossing pattern thrown right on the five. Wide receiver had no choice but to make the catch and then get some run after catch yards, and that's a good sign for Michael Benson. He's truly the only Prairie View wide receiver that seems to be playing around 100%. Everybody else is banged up 80, 90%. He's got the fresh legs. And Sean Stevens. The top wide out of this team with a nice downfield block to, to give Benson a chance to get a few extra yards. On uh, first and ten, a whistle and a flag, and it looked like somebody jumped. Good quarterback being wild. He got him with a little voice inflection, getting him jump off sides, and first and five really puts Prairie View A&M in a great advantage. Yeah, penalty against Pine Bluff. Black to throw again. Slings it out, and Donald Babers can't hang on, so it'll be second down. 
and that's when you got to have. They brought Babers out of the backfield one on one versus safety. Did a great route, great throw by KJ Black. Everything was there but the catch. And you know, you wonder why offenses don't get it going. That's that timing we're talking about. They're just not in sync. That should be a normal pitch and catch for a big play, possibly a touchdown. Instead, just an incomplete pass. Faber stumbles and he didn't even get back to the line of scrimmage. Loss of three yards on the play. Jarvis Webb in on the stop. And that's good penetration over by Webb coming up from that safety position, but really like the penetration by number 91, Theodore McNeil. He jumped off sides earlier, but look at him hold his man steady. Force forces Babers to cut back to the inside. And that's what you want from your defensive end. Get that strong upfield rush. Don't slow, show the wide receiver the running back daylight and force him to cut back inside. A third down, Black under pressure, and he's just going to throw it away. So it'll be fourth down. Brandon Thurmond applying the pressure, and the kicking unit will come on for Prairie View A&M. Brady Faggard will try the field goal. He's four for five on field goals this season. He's only missed from 38 yards. This one will be from 33 yards. So Prairie View with a chance to get on the board first. Two and three on the season did win their last game at Mississippi Valley State. Snap the hold the kick. And it is wide right. So Faggard misses the kick. And Arkansas Pine Bluff will get the ball back. Prairie View had a chance to take, take the lead early, but still scoreless here in the first quarter. ESPNU College Football Primetime is presented by McDonald's. No score here in Arkansas Pine Bluff between Prairie View and the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff as Fagger just missed a field goal from 33 yards out. But when you talk about the SWAC, they have 11 players in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And Prairie View is represented by Ken Houston. Ken Houston, of course, was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame back in 1996. He played with the Houston Oilers and the the Washington Redskins, the Oilers drafted him in the ninth round in 1967. He became a starter as a defensive back in the third game of his rookie season, and his career spanned 14 years. And let's go back upstairs. Kenny Houston, one of the 11 SWAC players in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Gentlemen. All right, thank you, Charlie. It's nice to have a historian down on the field, isn't it? <laughs> a a, a walk-in encyclopedia of knowledge. Third possession of the game for Pine Bluff. On first down, it's a run. And a solid run out across the 20 yard line by Justin Billings. Let's send it back down to Charlie. Well, we're talking about Prairie View AM. You know, it was founded in 1876. It's the only founding member of the SWAC that's still in the conference. There are 8,900 students enrolled in the second oldest institution of higher learning in the state of Texas. And Dr. George C. Wright is the president. All right, thanks, Charlie. Prairie View also the only charter member remaining in the SWAC conference. Did you know that they were the second oldest university in the state of Texas? As Charlie told us. That behind, is a project uh, behind Texas A&M, yeah. On second and six, it's another run. It's Billings, the freshman. And he gets a first down, a gain of 11 yards on the play. And that's sort of par for the course for a guy who came in averaging more than 11 yards per carry. Yeah, you know, see low to the ground, watch him explode, get to daylight, then lower the pad level. Look at that. Once you get that much speed, momentum going, hey, if you've got speed, that's a way to neutralize mass. Five, 670 pounds, but when you run that low to the ground with that much speed, you can lower the boom on somebody, put a little punishment out yourself. Yeah, and Billings, he's a guy coaches say he's got home run hitting ability, a 59-yard run, and a 64-yard run in the last two weeks. To the air on first down and to Weber, but he's gobbled up immediately. John Mark Henderson right there, and that time they didn't let Weber get those extra yards after the catch. Now that's one where it was all set up by you get the running game going, and once you run the football, then you can really soften up those cornerbacks and start to throw the football. So 
look for Arkansas Pine Bluff to try and have some balance. You know, they've been kind of relying upon solely throwing the football. Now they'd like to get the running game going, too. Four wide receivers set here on second down and five. They'll keep it on the ground. Nice move by Billings. And then he takes a big hit. It's Chris Adingapu coming up from the secondary, the team leader in tackles. And he takes down Billings. Yeah, you know, talking about Chris Adingapu, the best athlete on this roster. Watch him just fly across your screen. He's going to get some momentum and bow. Left your shoulder, cut him off, good angle. Running back dances too much to the outside. You put a big body on him and make him pay when you tackle. Billings, a senior out of Miami, Florida. Coaches say he's one of the team leaders on this defense. Came in with a team high 38 tackles. That was number 39. And he's one of those guys who can play all over the secondary. You know, they start to use him at cornerback in some instances. He has a great frame. They really like his size, speed, and athleticism. Timeout Arkansas Pine Bluff as they'll talk over strategy on third and four. And we'll step aside as well. 2.46 to go in the first quarter. Still no score in Pine Bluff. Sorry, I'm late, fellas. Oh, it's cool. It's cool. Uh, <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what is that? Huh? How come my dad wasn't like that? Well, this is just us. Third and four, Pine Bluff. That's Adrian Moore back in the game, and the coaching staff was telling us they've been practicing the Wildcat, and if they run it, it's going to be Moore who's going to get the direct snap. They haven't used it in a game yet. Let's see what they do here on third and four. Moore in the backfield with Boudreaux. It's a straight snap to Boudreaux. He throws it over the middle, and he completes to his tight end, Brad Niedemeyer, and that's enough for a first down, a gain of six yards on the play. Niedemeyer coming from his tight end position. Just a simple curl up right over the middle. Find a soft spot in the zone, deliver a strike to him. Easy pitch, easy catch, easy first down. Brad Niedemeyer comes all the way to Prime Bluff, Arkansas from King Salmon, Alaska. He was actually a Juco teammate with the team's kicker, Chris Ewald. And Ewald got here and said, you know, we got a pretty good tight end. He might be from Alaska, but he can be pretty good. And here he is playing for the Golden Lions. Flag on the play on first down. That's Niedemeyer again. And he bullies his way across midfield. Gain of four yards on the play. Met by John Mark Henderson, but in Prairie View territory. See, if you keep feeding them and keep giving the ball, that could be the Alaskan pipeline. There you go. A bridge to somewhere, perhaps. Awesome. Defense, number 48, five yards, replay, first down. That was Jarvis Wilson who jumped. So it'll be first down and five now for Arkansas Pine Bluff. They'll accept the penalty, and they've got to take a catch away from Niedemeyer. From the pipeline. So Arkansas Pine Bluff in Prairie View territory. Throw under center this time. It's a give to Moore. He spins across the 45-yard line and gets down to the 42. A gain of six yards on the play. Marcus White making the stop for the Panthers. Yeah, good job here by the pulling pull and tackle. Look at big number 70, Teron Armstead. Get out there, get a body out there on the outside linebacker there. Anytime you can get big linemen moving, getting in space, normally ends up being a good run play. That's what you get now. I mean, that just lets you know. I mean, I remember it was a big thing when you used to have a pulling guard. Mm -hmm. Now you got pulling tackles. O lineman, a lot more athletic these days, a lot more bigger and a lot more faster. You would think you'd have to sacrifice speed for size, but uh, the way the game has gone and the way the game has evolved, that hasn't been the case. It's not fair to pull 6'5, 335 pound men. No. <laughs> Boudreaux under pressure. He slings it out to Moore. Moore makes one guy miss and gets across the 40 to about the 37. That by about three players in white, including Quinton Spears, the defensive end, gain of three yards on the play. And that was a good decision by Josh Boudreaux. Won't show up as a big game, but could have forced the ball downfield. Had two receivers that were giving him the old wide receiver. I'm open, I'm open, throw it to him. He didn't realize they had defensive back standing right behind him. So when he scrambled from the pocket, kept his vision downfield, rather than him doing the selfish thing and trying to pick up some rushing yards, 
Get the ball to one of your running backs in space. See if they can make a guy miss. That's what they're on scholarship for, to make guys miss. Number 86, Raymond Weber, lined up in the slot at the bottom of your screen. Boudreaux throws, and he completes the far side. That's to Rontrell Bailey. Bailey's the backup quarterback on this team, but he's also seen some reps at wide receiver. In fact, we saw him running routes at the end of practice yesterday. Yeah, he's a guy that, you know, good athlete and can play, got the size to get out there and do things. You know, Monty Coleman, Coach Coleman said, hey, I like to use him like an H-back. You know, yep. he played for the Redskins, and anybody ever played for a Joe Gibbs personnel is going to know about having an H-back, and that seems to be the role of Rontrell Bailey. And that catch takes us to the end of the first quarter. 15 minutes in the books in Pine Bluff. We're still scoreless. So, so far in this game, Prairie View defensive end Ken Spears, number 90, comes up with a big sack of Josh Boudreaux, and that's the reason we're still scoreless here in Pine Bluff in this Western Division matchup. As you look at Quentin Spears on the sideline, let's throw it back up to Anish. Thank you, Charlie. Quentin Spears, not a very big guy in terms of size, 6'4". He was actually recruited as a wide receiver. Slender, they say he's built like a greyhound. He's going to have to bulk up if he's going to play at the next level. Here they go. It's the Wildcat, and it's Adrian Moore, and Prairie View sniffed it out. I was talking about it earlier. That's something they had been practicing and practicing all season. This is the first time they actually used it in a game, but Prairie View all over it. Yeah, you got to get some blocking. A great individual effort there on the defensive line by Jarvis Wilson. Sniffed it out, made a guy miss, got in the space, tackle for loss in the backfield. I think you'll see Wildcat again. Well, it didn't work the first time. It's one thing to use it in practice. It's another thing to use it in a game. And Arkansas Pine Bluff will punt for the second time. They'll punt in Prairie View territory. Kent Black's kick goes out of bounds. And while we have a minute, let's send it down on the field to Charlie Neal. Charlie? Well, one of the things we talked about was uh, Kenny Houston from the Prairie View team, who's in the Hall, Pro Football Hall of Fame. One of the most notable alums from the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff is L.C. Greenwood. He played 14 years in the National Football League. He was a 10th round choice in 1969, drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers. He went on to play, as I said, 14 years, was a member of the famous Steel Curtain defensive line earning four Super Bowl rings with the Steelers. He deserves to be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He was a finalist back in 2006. Gentlemen. All right. Thank you, Charlie. It'll be Prairie View starting deep in its own zone at its own eight-yard line. On the ground on first time, this is Donald Babers trying to find some space. And he gets across the 10 yard line. Let's go back to Charlie for more. Well, Arkansas a Pine Bluff was formerly known as Arkansas AM and N. The school was founded back in 1873, one of the last two schools to join the SWAC. They came into the conference back in 1997. They have 3,800 students enrolled. And Dr. Lawrence A. Davis, Jr., is the school's chancellor. Gentlemen. Arkansas AM and N. That just doesn't roll off the tongue easily. Yeah, I'm going to let you give a try at it there. But a M and N. I haven't heard of an A M and M before. Heard of an A and M? Heard of an A and I? Not an A M and M. Giovanni Harvey on the stop there after another run from Babers, and that run good enough for a first down and gain of nine on the play. So let's see if Prairie View can get this offense the moving. They've been inconsistent on offense this season, and again early in the season, they didn't have K J Black. He missed the first two games. A guy who was the SWAC preseason Player of the Year. Black, the quarterback. Hands it off again. It's Babers breaks a tackle and gets across the 30 yard line. A gain of 11 on the play. Matthew Price in on the stop. And Babers was another guy, all conference, first team a year ago. Seven rushes, 39 yards so far in this game. He's a workhorse. We're going to see Pine Bluff use about four guys who they're going to give the ball to. It's pretty much going to be Babers for Prairie View. Babers, 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 and some more Babers. And, you know, the slight guy, 5'10, 190 pounds, but doesn't play that way. Plays strong, knows how to hit the hole hard. North South, they call it, right? Oh, what a cut. Uh, you can go a little east west, too, there. Babers, another nice run. 
And he looks to have another Panther first down. James Harrell making the stop. And it's not a good sign when guys from the secondary keep tackling the running back. You know, Babers is one of those guys. He's an edge of your seat runner. You know, when he was running at his peak last year, every time he got the ball, he just felt like he could make something happen. And we're starting to see that here tonight. Every time he touches it, he's got that little extra shake, that extra step where you think he's capable of taking it to the house on every single carry. And Sean Stevens in motion. And Black throws it to Stevens. He tries to escape the first tackler. Eventually, he's taken out of bounds by Jerian Harris, the true freshman out of Memphis. And he's one of the guys that we highlighted on this Arkansas Pine Bluff defense. He might be a true freshman, but hasn't played like it so far for Monty Coleman. And the reason we asked the coach, why is Jerian Harris so special? They said, you know, as a freshman, he's got football IQ. and He runs sideline to sideline, has a great motor, and he's got plenty of upside. And Monty Coleman, he wore number 51 for a long time with the Redskins. He took number 51 from another player and gave it to Harris. I mean, that's high praise right there. Black on second down. Quick screen. And that's the tight end, Alonzo Revolcha. Gain of five yards. It's going to bring up a third down. Jarvis Webb in on the stop. And there is Monty Coleman. Played a long time in the NFL with the Washington Redskins, 16 seasons, and he was a standout at Central Arkansas, too. You know, before Scottie Pippen, Central Arkansas was Monty Coleman, right? That's, a, that's the only time I'd heard of the score before Scottie Pippen came along with Monty Coleman. He had 22 career interceptions while playing for UCA. We got a timeout. Prairie View AM takes a timeout with 11.03 to go. It'll be third and two from the 46 yard line when we come back. Welcome to McDonald's. May I take your order? Yeah, uh, we'll have uh... playing. 11.02 to go here in the first half. Still scoreless. Prairie View AM so far with its longest drive of the evening. They have 69 total yards. 50 of them coming by Donald Babers, their running back. And they're starting to heat him up, and he's starting to have that pep in the step. And when you've got a running back that's on fire like that, and you've got third and one and two, hey, that means your offensive playbook is operating on all cylinders. You can either run for it or you can throw for it. Third and two, K.J. Black from the shotgun. They keep it on the ground, and it's a give to Babers, and he looks to have the first down. Needed two, he got three. Jerian Harris uh, again on the stop for Pine Bluff. That was a great second effort. Uh, let me ask you a question on the on the be the dean. Okay. We go out there and make your own interactive campus. What's the first thing you're going to go click on to try and build your university? I'd like a nice stadium first. Stadium. You know, I've gotten some of those invitations on Facebook and haven't really looked at it yet, but it sounds intriguing. First and ten, Prairie View. Black steps up, and down he goes. Nowanko Jackson, number 96, with the sack, a loss of six yards on the play. Now, now this is one of those sacks that K.J. Black didn't have to take. Take a look at Babers. He's going to go out there, a little check down route, uncovered. The moment you see that, you should be trying to get him the football. You know, that's one where you got a guy that's wide open. If you get sacked like that, be because you don't have time in the pocket, but not because you did not go through your progressions. I was actually number 90, Arthur Thomas, on the sack. And K.J. Black, he had the knee injury, hurt himself in spring ball. Actually, after spring ball, while he was running, missed the first two games. And the one thing that the coaches say he doesn't really have back fully is his mobility. He's pretty much a pocket passer right now. Yeah, and it's, that's really not operating on all cylinders. That's tough to play quarterback with two legs, let alone one and a half. Babers can certainly run the football, and he gets a lot of those yards that were lost on the sack back. Got nine on the play, and then it will bring up a third down and a much more manageable seven. Raymond Duplachain in on the stop for Pine Bluff. Throwing no huddle here, and a flag on the play. See, and you know, the thing about it, we talked about KJ Black and having the mobility. Timeout. Pine Bluff. And Arkansas Pine Bluff got a timeout off before Prairie View could get that playoff. But it looked like for Henry Frazier and the Panthers, a smart call. Defense not quite ready. Let's see if we can get the playoff. 
Hey, a quick reminder, Saturday morning, ESPNU previews a busy day in college football at 9 a.m. Eastern. Aaron Andrews joins the game day crew and hosts college game day built by the Home Depot. Then at 10 a.m. Eastern, catch a college football version of Sports Nation at 11, 11 a.m. Eastern. We get the latest news from all the big game sites on college football. Whip around and don't miss a single moment on ESPNU this Saturday. For more information, you can log on to ESPNU.com. And here's a full slate of what we can see this Saturday. Central Michigan, a team that we saw earlier in this season against Temple, goes to Blacksburg. They'll play Virginia Tech, Virginia and Georgia Tech, all ACC matchup there. Nevada, boy, they're in the top 25, and that could be a potential stumbling block down the road for Boise State. Could be a potential showcase for Colin Kaepernick this weekend. You can see him on national TV. That's right. We haven't seen him play before. He's something special to watch. The quarterback from Nevada, 6'6", about 230, can run it and throw it. Yeah, one of the leaders in the nation in total offense on third and seven. Black finds Sean Stevens, and he's going to be well short of a first down. He lost a couple of yards there. Jarvis Webb making the tackle. So Prairie View and a 10-play drive, but it'll end in a punt. Fourth and eight from midfield, and so far neither offense has really had any success moving the ball downfield. And you know they've made a lot of plays, but so far Prairie View they had one chance for a big play, but Black overshot the tight end over the middle. They also got into Pine Bluff territory, but missed the field goal. They kick it away here on fourth down. Low snap. It was bobbled by Pedro Venturi. He gets the punt off. It takes a bounce. Inside the 20, hit a Prairie View player. And it's eventually down near the 15-yard line. A 23-yard punt. Ventura putting his hands up in the air. What happened? Pine Bluff ball when we get back. Daddy, the truck's here. When you want more cargo room, Enterprise will pick you up. Any of our properties or double points. ESPNU College Football Primetime is brought to you by Enterprise Rent a Car. We'll pick you up. You know, players from the Southwestern Athletic Conference and the FCS are going to have a hard time ever winning the Heisman Trophy, but there are a couple of awards that they can shoot for, starting with the Walter Payton Award. And of course, that goes to the top offensive player in the FCS. On the defensive side, the Buck Buchanan Award goes to the top defensive player, and the Eddie Robinson Award goes to the top coach in the FCS. All of these awards are named after SWAC legends. Of course, Buck Buchanan played for Eddie Robinson at Grambling, while Walter Payton made his mark at Jackson State. Now, only three SWAC participants have ever won any of the awards. The Walter Payton Award went to Grambling running back Walter Dean back in 1990, while Steve McNair of Alcorn won it in 1990. And the first and only coach from an HBCU to win the Eddie Robinson Award went to Henry Frazier of Prairie View. He won it last year. He's very proud of that. Gentlemen. Thank you, Charlie. And Henry Frazier has authored quite the turnaround for this Prairie View program from 1989 to 1998. They lost 80 straight games. Ouch. First and 10, Pine Bluff. Play action. Goudreau throws it long, and he completes... It's Raymond Weber. That's out of the norm for this offense. This is really a dink and dump screen and slant offense. And that time, bought a little time with the play action. He finds his number one receiver, yeah. Weber, downfield. What a great throw. Going to his left. Watch him set up. Find a weakness in that defense. Quick footwork. See how quickly he turned his feet, got him square, and delivered a shot down there to Raymond Weber in between the safety and the cornerback. That's a big time throw by Josh Pedro. Weber already up to five catches, averaging 10 per game. It's a run on first down, and that's the freshman, Justin Billings. Actually, it was uh, Dabian Woodfin, the junior, getting the carry. We saw Billings earlier. We saw Adrian Moore. Woodfin getting 13 there. They got four horsemen they'll give the ball to. It's Moore, Billings, Woodfin, and also John Tony, number 38, who you'll also see at some point in this game. So another first down for Arkansas Pine Bluff. One of the things this offense implemented in the offseason was a spread offense. Right now we're looking at a player down on the field. It's Eric Moore. Rather, uh, Adrian Grant, number 23. Trainers tending 
DeGrant is uh, one of the safeties on this team, redshirt freshman. Let's see what happens here, Jay. Yeah, coming in there. Ooh. Oh, just threw his head in there. And that's one of the things they tell you, you know, you got to see what you hit. You never want to have that head looking down at the ground as you're going to make a tackle. You want to keep that up. And he got that head down. Then when the hit came, went further into the turf and just looks a little woozy. Sometimes the hardest hit you face can be from the ground. Yeah, doesn't need another human being. Henry Frazier looking on. He's got to be thinking. I mean, you talk about a, a coach that we talked to that was like the injury bug has just decimated this team. But, you know, the one place they are strong is the secondary. The defensive coordinator, Heish Northern, said the strength of this defense are the DBs. Here's another look at the injury, though. Yeah, they had that head down, that knee, knee blow to the head, then falling on the turf as well. So got rattled around. Hope he's okay. Weber, five catches already. He's at the bottom of your screen. It's the tight end, Niedermeyer in motion. Now lining up in that H-back position. Woodfin across the 40. Another strong run. And down to about the 35-yard line. A gain of 15 yards on the play. Moses Ellis finally made the stop. Yeah, you talk about Niedermeyer coming from that H-back position. Did a good job of actually getting in motion and getting the seal blocking. like that seal block there put on by Niedermeyer. Anytime you can get a H-back tight end in the backfield, get some momentum sealed to the outside, running backs easily can make that cut run in the daylight. Twin tight ends now for Pine Bluff. This is a give to Adrian Moore. Tries to use the stiff arm. Got maybe a yard. John Mark Henderson in on the stop. Second down and nine coming up. When you Adrian Moore down, that's what happened with a running back. You know, the fall in love with bouncing to the outside and thinking every time they see a little space on the outside, they run to it. Well, every now and then the defense will set you up and they'll bait you to run sideline to sideline and let their team speed catch up to you. And I think that's what you saw there with Adrian Moore. You see Josh Boudreau there. He's eight of nine. Five of his completions have gone to Raymond Weber. And that's sort of what the story has been all season. He came into the game with 80 completions, 40 to Raymond Weber. Play action here on second down. Weber throwing long, and it's incomplete. Cordera Frazier, the intended receiver. When we talk about Raymond Weber getting the ball, look where he's getting it. First play of the game, they come out and establish his presence, six-yard route, run after catch. Then the wide receiver screen, getting the ball in traffic. And then along the outside there, once again, he's got the separation from the defensive backs. That enables him to get plenty of yards after the catch. Raymond Weber's got great size, 6'3", 200 pounds. But more impressively, he's got the separation from defensive backs that all quarterbacks love throwing to. He has seven touchdowns, which leads the swag, and he's lined up at the bottom of your screen. They'll line him up all over. On third down, Boudreaux under pressure, and he is taken down by Lester Butler, who came up on the corner blitz. A loss of nine on the play, and a fourth down coming up. And you're going to see Lester Butler just come flying out of there. He's unaccounted for what they have called a little zone blitz in the backfield, and that's what you do in order to get pressure. Overload one side, play zone behind it. By the time Boudreaux recognizes he's got a guy coming unprotected to the quarterback, too late to get rid of the football. Great call by defensive coordinator Heisman Northern from Prairie View A&M. So Pine Bluff has been in Prairie View territory three times, and they still haven't scored. They'll punt it away here. Kent Black gets the kickoff. Spencer Nelson will watch it bounce at the 14-yard line, and it goes out of bounds. Yeah, so you talk about bringing the pressure. Hey, this is the way you draw it up. You overload one side, you get an unblocked guy on the quarterback hitting him. Oh, yeah, that's what they like to do. We enhanced the driver's sensation of speed in the Lexus Supercar. I'm Bo Galindo coming up on the State Farm Halftime Report. Bill Snyder hoping for a happy birthday in a battle of Big 12 North undefeated. South Carolina and Alabama. Why it could mean just as much away from the football field. And Jay Walker, Charles Arbuckle with a little college pick'em. And Nish, word on the street is Jay's creeping back in this one. Lowell, uh, Jay reminded me that he's actually in the lead going into this week. And 
If you want to play college, pick them. You can too. Log on to ESPN.com under the Fantasy tab. Click on College Football Pick 'em and pick the winner of 10 college football games a week and rank them in order of how confident you are in each. And you can play one week. You can play all season long. There's weekly prizes and, of course, a, a grand prize at season's end. Prairie View ball. They'll start on their own 13-yard line. Still scoreless with five and a half to go here in the first half. Stevens makes the catch, and he's out across the 20-yard line. Actually, that was not uh, Sean Stevens. Brandon Bell. Brandon Bell. Yeah, the senior wide receiver from Pompano. Mm -hmm. That's in Florida, in case you didn't know. We're going there in a few weeks, Daytona Beach. Bethune Cookman. That's one of the stories of black college football this season, Anish. I mean, you're talking about a team that was, you know, bottom of the MEAC last season. Now this year leading the country in scoring. And there were some questions out there about the validity of the Bethune-Cookman offense. Well, I think they answered that when they went out there and put 69 points on Morgan State last weekend. First down after a short run by Babers. And that's a quick out, and it's Babers out of the backfield. Gain of five on the play. Matthew Price in on the stop. Say this about Matthew Price. Arkansas Pine Bluff head coach Monty Coleman said he's slow, small, underweight, but he's a ball player. <laughs> Donald Babers, he's quick. That time he runs into the teeth of the Golden Lion defense. Gain of a yard, third down coming up. Now, now do you get the sense that because we're at 0-0 zero, zero, and probably the frustration from the offensive staff that offensive coordinator Michael Bryan is starting to tell Prairie View's offense, hey, let's step on the gas. Let's pick up the tempo. Let's hurry up and get a lot of plays called so we can find some sort of offensive rhythm. Coming up on four minutes to play. A flag on the play. Looked like somebody jumped. Let's listen to referee George McCollum. Awesome. Defense. Number 91. Five yards. Replay. Third down. That's on Theodore McNeil, the junior out of Augusta, Georgia. So now, instead of third and long, it's going to be third and short. And actually, it looks like it might be a first down. It's going to be a first down for Prairie View. So first and 10 <laughs> for the Panthers. They'll have the ball at their own 35-yard line. There's Babers. The ball comes loose, and it's recovered by Theodore McNeil. That's how you make up for the penalty. <laughs> Just be the right man the right place, and that's what you get when you, as a defensive end, you run down the football. He kept it going, came from the right end position. This play's going away from McNeil, and you're going to see Babers get it, get the handoff, and gets hit right away. Two guys get there, strip that ball. McNeil makes the fumble recovery. Yeah, and it looked like Jerian Harris, the freshman who got his hand in there to knock the ball away. Yeah, it is Harris. He sure did. I mean, he, he, that's textbook. That's what they're talking about with the football IQ. Not only did he have the running back, but once he had him in control, just decided to strip him as he was going to the ground. That's great coach and fundamentally sound football. He's a true freshman, so give credit to his high school football coach of doing a good job of having him ready to play big time college football. Uh, he's led this team in tackles in every game this season. So now Arkansas Pine Bluff. They've been inside Prairie View territory three times already. Still no points. The ball on the 34 yard line. Boudreau, play action. Throws it out, and that's nearly intercepted. Jamel Levant was out in coverage, and boy, that was a risky throw. Man, he did a good job. You talk about having a zone blitz and covering some ground. You know, Jamel Levant was in a three-point stance down there, fake like he was going to take one step upfield, then drop back in the coverage, and was almost there to pick off that pass. So instead, it's second down and ten. They're not really that comfortable with Boudreaux throwing the ball downfield. And a couple of weeks ago against Clark Atlanta, threw the ball downfield twice, and he was intercepted on two downfield throws. On the ground here on second down, and that's Billings. And the ball popped loose, but let's see if they say he was down. Looks like he was down. That was close there, and you see Billings doing a good job of showing why they like the young freshman running back, getting the space, setting up his blockers. But at the end of that run, you got to protect yourself. And oh yeah, the ground he clearly caused that. But. 
Billings was a kid who was actually recruited by Monty Coleman, the head coach. He saw Billings and John Tony play for El Dorado High School against Coleman's son. He says, you know what, I want these two guys pretty good. And they're both running backs. Yeah. That's Stephen Jones. He's their short yardage back. And he is going to be short of a first down. It'll bring up a fourth down and four. A loss of a yard on the play. Brennan Gordon in on the stop for Prairie View. So we get to see Chris Ewald come in and he'll have a chance to give this team a lead. He's perfect inside 40 yards this season. But this one's a 40 six yarder he actually had a 58 yarder against southern that he missed that was just short from what we were told ewald's kick boy he's got a strong leg plenty doesn't he? of leg plenty of you're leg. gonna be just short from 58 i guess 46 is no problem special teams gives arkansas pine bluff the 3-0 lead with 222 to go in the first half He's definitely got a live leg. I mean, this ball just shoots off his foot like a rocket. That thing's in the orbit. That thing might have been good from 56. He hits it deep into the net. Good release, good follow through. And head coach Monty Coleman told us yesterday that this guy has made 60, 61 yard kicks in practice. And he said he's comfortable with Ewald around 45, 46, 47 yards. But if you're in a late game situation, late in the half, end of game situation, and you need a 55 yarder, he said he won't hesitate. He'd bring Ewald in and let him try to kick it. And Ewald seems to be as good as advertised. I mean, he's got a lot of pop. What do you call if he's a baseball player? You say he'd have a live bat. Live bat. The ball jumps <laughs> off his bat. Well, the ball jumps off his foot. It's also got yellow shoes, which basically separate them from everybody on the field. Those are bright yellow. Now, yellow shoes. Let's see if you pick this up. Okay. Yellow shoes, Arkansas Pine Bluff. Golden Lions. No. <laughs> what is that? One more time. Yellow shoes, Arkansas Pine Bluff, NFL. Uh, it's before your time. I know. I know Charlie's down there just dying. He knows that. That's that's L.C. Greenwood. L.C. Greenwood. Oh man, that's what made him famous. You didn't know that, did you? Slightly before my time, perhaps. <laughs> Ewald, the line drive kick. It is bounced and taken at the 11-yard line by Michael Benson. And good return by Benson. Gets out across the 35-yard line. 26-yard return. Don't forget ESPN News coverage of college football continues Saturday with two games at 7 Eastern. Eastern Michigan faces Vanderbilt at 10.30 Eastern. It's Kyle Kaepernick and Nevada. Uh, they'll host San Jose State College Football primetime on ESPNU this Saturday. All right, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. You're, you're sitting here looking at these numbers, right? I mean, pretty close, right? Now, one is clearly the Heisman Trophy favorite, and the other one is can't even get a sniff of some Heisman Trophy action. I think level of competition and who you're playing is something oh, to do with. Oh, man, that means you don't like Boise State. I'm not saying I don't <laughs> like Boise State. But I think voters factor that in to their thinking sometimes. I mean, if you ask people around the nation, they'll say Denard Robinson has a secretariat at the Belmont type lead <laughs> on his competition in the Heisman race. You know, and we talked about that on the experts this week. And one of the things that I was pointing out was right now he's clearly the front runner. But I do think it's his Heisman trophy to lose. And, you know, the meat of his schedule is starting to come up, starting with Michigan State this weekend. You know, I don't think he can win the Heisman trophy taking on UMass. Black to throw here on second down, flushed out of the pocket. And it throws near side, but it's dropped by Sean Stevens. Well, the one thing that Denard Robinson has going for him is that Michigan's defense is not very good. They get lit up pretty much every week, so he's going to have meaningful snaps through the fourth quarter. The thing with him, I think, is trying to stay healthy. He's already been banged up a couple of times this season. He's had to leave one game, left one game, and came back. And can he stay healthy with the punishment he takes? And, and they're just getting a Big Ten play. I mean, that's going to be the key. I mean, you know, those numbers, it's great he got out to a good start needed to against that competition. But as you start to get those turf competition, you got to think those numbers will go down or at least slow down. Black on third down completes, and it's a first down. That was a rocket throw. That was Brandon Bell hauling it in on the far sideline. This is, nine. this is how you separate the boys from the men. Watch this. Pew! Get that ball out there. DB thinks he's got the angle, tries to make the bat down or the pass breakup. Not there. Not with a strong arm quarterback like KJ Black throwing on rhythm and time. 
got to take a safer angle there if you're the defensive back. Very fortunate that the wide receiver didn't stay in and cut up field, pick up additional yardage. You know, Charlie uh, down on the sideline mentioned the Walter Payton Award watch list. And KJ Black started the year on that watch list. He completes to Stevens here. He turns backwards, now upfield, and he's going to be close to another Panther first down. Derek Timber finally brought him down. And you see KJ Black got hit at the end of this play here. And every time he goes down, they get a little nervous. So you see KJ standing there, gets hit, wrestled down right on that left knee. And every time he touches the ground, that Prairie View sideline kind of is like, get up, KJ, get up. Well, they give him the first down, so a first and 10 from the 40. Black throws again to Stevens, but that's incomplete. Stevens, a fifth-year senior. He's the go-to guy in this passing game. We had a chance to speak to him on a conference call on Tuesday, and he said, he sees himself as a Steve Smith type, a quick guy. And how about K.J. Black there? He looked to have a little bit of a lift there at the end of that last play. Yeah, you know, you can see the body English there. And, you know, he's toughing it out. and He's got a definite limp. He's got the left knee brace, but that's only going to give you so much protection. And that left leg is just not there. Yeah, remember, he missed two games with that left knee injury. And here he's forced to tuck it in. Mm -hmm. And he's not going to get anywhere. We mentioned his mobility early on in the telecast. That's something that's not back yet. He can still make the reads and make the throws, but he's not really a factor in the running game. And, and I think if you're Coach Henry Frazier, at a certain point during this season, you, you've got to ask yourself, when do I take him out and just rest him for another week? Because he gets healthier every week, but that last run he had, that attempt at a scramble, he looked pretty defensive, trying to make a cut to his left off of that left leg. Couldn't do it. Just don't want him to do any further damage to that knee. Henry Frazier told us he won't be better than 85% all season. He says he's about 75% going into this game. And the first game he started against Alabama State, Frazier said he shouldn't have started him. He wasn't ready. He wasn't healthy enough. We've got a timeout here with 34 seconds to go in the first half. 3-0 Arkansas Pine Bluff. It'll be third and 15 for Prairie View. And here's our Facebook question. We've already mentioned some SWAC greats who've had some awards named after them. So we want to know from you which former SWAC player had the best NFL career. Remember last week our question was, who was the greatest MEAC player of all time? And Jay was saying it was Jay. But our question this week was saying, who's the SWAC player who's had the best NFL career? Log on to Facebook.com slash ESPNU today and become a fan and voice your opinion. There'll be some surprise votes out there. Uh, we can't do Jay Walker as a right in this time because he didn't play in the swag. Not, not a swag guy. No, not a swag guy. More of a swag killer. You know, when we went against him. But I think there'll be some names out there. You know, should we give him a couple names? That Jerry know? Rice, Walter Payton. I think going into it, Rice and, and Payton are the favorite. I definitely agree with that. Then, you know, you've got some guys, Michael Strahan, Texas sure. Southern. More, you know, the younger generation. Third and 12. Black. Had time, but the Fumble. pocket just collapsed. Fumbled that football. Ibrahim Abdullah among those in on the stop along with Arthur Thomas. You know, anytime you get pressure up the middle, pretty hard to run from it. And you see right there, Abdullah is right there. And, you know, when you don't have the mobility to really run right or left, then you're just a sitting duck. As a fourth sack by this Pine Bluff defense. And Arkansas Pine Bluff wants to call timeout with 13 seconds to play here in the first half. That's their final timeout. And I guess we can probably expect them to come after the punter here. I mean, I think so. That's what you call a timeout for. Try and make them punt the ball. Maybe they get a muff snap, and then you can recover in their field goal territory, in their territory right away. You got a kicker with a very long streak. So they've got to be thinking about all that. Get a good return. Set up a long field goal attempt going into the half. So Monty Coleman trying to play a little chess right now. You see longtime assistant coach Craig Gray. Craig Gray's assistant coach, brother Jimmy Ray, longtime NFL assistant coach. They've got good coach staff here. Vernon Dean, Coleman's former teammate with the Washington Redskins, is a linebacker coach here. So well coached group of kids here in UAPB. They've got two punt returners back deep. It's Pedro Ventura on to punt it, and we've got a whistle before the snap. And there's a flag on the play. False start. Number three. Offense. Five yards. Re-kick. Fourth down. So you're not helping your own calls right there. So now they're going to back you up some. And if you know 
that the Golden Lions are just trying to get within long field goal range. Don't help them out, giving them an extra five yards. It's Joe Dalton and Trey Austin back deep for Arkansas Pine Bluff. Ventura's punt and another whistle is blown dead. I think it was an issue with the clock. It says 13 seconds right now. It said 130 when the ball was snapped. Henry Frazier clearly upset on the Prairie View sideline. That was a good kick by Ventura. George McCollum is the head referee. We're waiting on his there ruling. There is no pin on the play. Now you know why Henry Frazier was so upset. <laughs> Great kick just gone for not. I think it was an issue with the clock again. Right when they snapped the ball, it said 130 left. There's only 13 seconds left here in the first half. Dalton and Austin back deep, low snap. They'll let the kick bounce. And it's going to roll inside the 15 where Prairie View will down it. Two seconds left on the clock here in the first half. Probably just a knee. Yeah, and that's a mental error there. If you're going to call the timeout to try and force them to punt the ball, and then they set up a return, they didn't set up punt block, then you want your guys to go up there. You've got two returners back there. You want them to run up and field the ball, fair catch it, keep as much time as possible on the clock. Well, when that kick bounced, I guess the danger there is if one of your players gets a hand on it, you can't get it cleanly, Prairie View recovers. All of a sudden, they can kick a field goal, and you have a tie game going at halftime. Yes, yes. So, I mean, the key thing is run up there. You've got two returners. Catch the ball. Don't Aren't let coaches it roll. conservative by nature? Yeah, especially defensive coaches. Boudreaux will just take the knee, and Arkansas Pine Bluff will go into halftime with a 3 nothing lead. So again, it's 3-0 here in Pine Bluff at halftime. Right now, let's go to Lowell Galindo and Charles Arbuckle in the studio for the State Farm Halftime Report. Fellas. Thank you, Nick. The nation's fastest mobile broadband network, AT&T. Rethink possible. The new BlackBerry Torch with a slide-out keyboard for $199.99. Only from AT&T. Presented by McDonald's, Prairie View A&M, Panthers taking on the Arkansas Pine Bluff Golden Lions. Only three points on the board here as we get ready to start the second half. That came on the foot of Chris Ewald. He kicked a 46-yard field goal with just about 222 left in the first half. It's been a defensive struggle so far in this first half. Now let's go back upstairs. Gentlemen. Defensive struggle is right. Anish Raf here with Jay Walker. Both teams under 100 yards of total offense. K.J. Black trying to come back from that knee injury. He's had a couple of games, but boy, the Arkansas Pine Bluff defense has applied the pressure, and they've sacked him four times. Yeah, plenty of pressure has been applied to K.J. Black. And when you're going to have a team that's going to give you pressure, you got to hurt him with the big play. And we saw several opportunities. K.J. Black missed wide open wide receivers that would have hurt that blitzing defense, and they would have eased off of bringing that pressure. He was sacked four times in the first half. They've got to find a way to protect him. And if you're Arkansas Pine Bluff, they're doing a good job of getting the ball to Weber, but what they've got to do is get him in the end zone, so that's what they're trying to work on. Jay, before the game, you outlined a lesson plan for each team. We're at halftime. Midterm grades? Yeah, let's take a look. I mean, you talk about pass happy. Well, they've only thrown for 54 yards. I told you I'm a nice professor. I don't give F, so I gave them the D, so they get the D on the scorecard, on the lesson plan there. Secondary defense, uh, they've kind of shut down, uh, they've shut Weber down a little bit. I'll give them a good job on there. He hasn't gotten to the end zone. For Arkansas, for Arkansas Pine Bluff, Weber's touches, well, he's right on pace. Five touches, he averages about over 10 catches a game. He's on pace, I gave him a B. QB pressures, they got to the quarterback. They've got uh, four sacks on K.J. Black, so that's something we need to update there. I'm giving them a good job there, so they're getting it done if you're Arkansas Pine Bluff. Prairie View will get the football first. Ewald the kickoff, Spencer Nelson, Michael Benson back deep. And from a yard deep in his own end zone, this is Benson. And he gets to about the 25-yard line. And that's where Prairie View will start on offense to begin the second half. As you mentioned, K.J. Black in that first half at 10 of 16, just 54 yards. But again, we have to remember, he hurt his knee running after spring ball, missed the uh, first two games of the season. And 
just 75 percent according to the coaches coming into this game and one of the things they did say is that they have to protect him and their offensive coordinator Michael Bryant said they have to protect him well four sacks in the first half if you're Prairie View that's got to be unacceptable I mean four sacks giving up four sacks in a game is tough you give up in the first half and you know going into this game that your quarterback has a bad leg you should really be trying to protect him offensive line is just not getting it done for Prairie View black to the air on first down finds Stevens and he is knocked out of bounds a solid gain of 12 on the play. Giovanni Harvey pushed him out. Halftime adjustment. Well, we're going to protect KJ in the second half, right? No, we're not. Here comes Hero. Ibrahim Abdullah making a hit on KJ. So KJ got the completion, but he got hit. Got to stop letting KJ Black get hit. Abdullah is a pretty tough guy to block. He's somebody NFL scouts are looking at. We saw at practice yesterday scouts from both the Colts and Seahawks. This is Babers. Broke one tackle. And he gets another first down, and with two plays, already Prairie View across midfield and into Pine Bluff territory, 13 yards on that last run by Donald Babers, the senior out of Houston, Texas. And this is going to be a test here. You know, what did Monty Coleman say, which I thought was great wisdom, when he talked about the first five minutes of the second half yeah. is going to determine who wins the football game? Well, if Prairie View could put together a nice drive and get some points on the board, they may have a chance of winning this football game. Black. Again, throws near sideline, and again, it's Sean Stevens. And Jay, going back to what you said about Monty Coleman, the first five minutes of the third quarter is what he emphasizes. He says the team's got to come out with high intensity. They've got to make, make plays. And that he picked up from Joe Gibbs, playing under Joe Gibbs all those years in Washington. He said he's kind of used that philosophy and implemented it here with Pine Bluff. And he proved the theory I always had right. You've heard me say that, you know, great coaches make great halftime adjustments. That's when they earn their paychecks. Well, he just proved it to me right there, saying Joe Gibbs got it done in the second half. Baber, shifty little fella, and he gets all the way inside the 20-yard line. Boy, he was a mini Barishnikov there. <laughs> A Barishnikov on the football field. You said it, Anise. I didn't. Look at the moves right here. Cut one. Cut two. Step forward. Give him a leg. Take it back. Now show some power. Run through a tackle. Good job. Barishnikov. Fred Astaire. <laughs> I mean, somebody brought the dancing shoes. See, that's what I mean by he's an edge of your seat runner. When he's healthy and when he's really in his rhythm, he's a home run hitter, a threat to take it to the end zone every time he touches the football. Very exciting, one of the most exciting players in the SWAT conference. Had a big game against Pine Bluff last year, 133 yards rushing and two touchdowns. Black throws far side, and he completes to Brandon Bell, the fifth-year senior. He'll bring up second down, a gain of four on the play. And to go back to Babers, here's a guy who ran for more than 900 yards last year with nine touchdowns, first team all-conference. But he's had some knee issues this year, had some groin issues. Sort of been battling nagging injuries, but apparently he still has that quickness. And boy, he made some guys look silly. The explosive runner, a little banged up, but he's toughing it out. This is a senior campaign. You've got to leave it all on the field. On second down, Black slings it out to Benson. He makes a nice move, and he's tackled close to the five yard line, gain of eight yards on a play, and another first down. It'll be first and goal now for Prairie View. Jerian Harris in on the stop, and boy, this Prairie View offense marching right down the field. This looks nothing like the offense that we saw in the first half. It's amazing what some screaming will do in the locker room to kind of get you going and get you in gear. On first and goal, this is Babers breaks the tackle, and he caps the drive with a five-yard touchdown, and Prairie View with a 6-3 lead as they've taken the lead here on the road and they'll try to make it 7-3 with the point after. Heavy dose of Donald Babers in that drive there. Got it going with the running game. Some accurate passing by K.J. Black. Staying the tough in the pocket still while getting hit tough. Passes in the face of pressure. The point after is good. So it is 7-3, Prairie View, a seven-play, 74-yard drive. They do it all in just two minutes and 33 seconds, 7-3 Panthers. This telecast is presented in high definition on ESPN UHD by Comcast. After the ball game.
Welcome back to Pine Bluff and ESPNU College Primetime presented by McDonald's 7-3 Prairie View A&M over Arkansas Pine Bluff. It's time to bring the flavor of tonight's game brought to you by McDonald's. Tonight's McDonald's who brought the flavor. Terrific halftime show put on by the uh, Pine Bluff marching band. M4. M4. It's a nickname. M4. M4 was that uh, educate me. That's Charlie Neal's job to educate you. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's the magnificent marching man. I'll get that for you. I, you're right. I got to get that acronym. Kickoff taken at the 10 yard line, and this is Trey Austin. And he gets to about the 30 yard line. And that's where Arkansas Pine Bluff will start. Monty Coleman, as we told you before, he stresses the first five minutes of the third quarter. Couldn't be happy with what he saw in the first two and a half minutes. Prairie View AM. Marching down in seven plays going 74 yards for a touchdown and right now there's a Panther player down at the 25 yard line. It's Javarian Richardson. Trainers attending to him and right now he's down on his stomach. <laughs> Coleman in the first five minutes he said that's where a team has a chance to make his mark. That's where a chance. The game could be won and sometimes lost. And right now, Monty Coleman and Pine Bluff trailing 7-3. They'll have the football at the 31 when we come back. Friday, ranked number 11 in the ESPN Rise 150. QB in Florida commit Jeff Driscoll leads Haggerty against Winter Springs. The action begins Friday at 8 on ESPNU. All right, agents. What do we got? An older guy picked up a young girl at a local bait shop, wanted to impress her, so they went for a spin. Too much throttle coming out of a figure eight, lost control, ramped off a dock, ended up in a tulip poplar. Nope, but he scored for most of the first half, but Arkansas Pine Bluff got a field goal. 46-yarder from Chris Ewald. Prairie View answered with a seven-play, 74-yard drive to open the second half, and they have a 7-3 lead after Donald Babers capped that drive with a touchdown. Pine Bluff's first play of the second half, an incomplete pass from Josh Boudreau. Boudreau, 8 of 11 in the first half. Five of those throw. They went to Raymond Weber. Surprise, surprise. Coming into the game, Weber had 40 of the team's 80 receptions. Second and ten. This is a handoff and a short gain. It'll bring up third and long. Gain of two yards. Max Century on the stop. And that was the freshman Justin Billings getting the ball on second down. Now this is a time right here for Arkansas Pine Bluff. This is like the measuring stick moment for this football team. You know, Pine Bluff's coming. They've got people excited. They beat Southern first time they've done that in a long time last week. Now they want to know how good their football team is. Well, you're taking on a good Prairie View team, best team you faced on your schedule. They've went ahead on you at your home field, got the lead. How's your team going to rebound? This is how you measure the direction the season is going to go for the Gold Lions here in this second half of football. Raymond Weber, the top receiver at the bottom of your screen. Boudreaux, though, is going to keep it. He's got the first down. He's in the Panther territory. Taken down at the 41-yard line, a gain of 24 yards on the play. Finally taken down by Eric Moore. Well, he answered the call. One thing Boudreaux has is great size. 6'4", 240 pounds. Look at the footwork, making the first guy miss. And you can't arm tackle him. He's going to run through an arm tackle every time. He's got good base. That's what I like is your senior quarterback. Put it on your shoulders. Take the lead. You know your team needs a first down. Make your read, your progressions, take off, pick up positive yardage. He ran for over 100 yards against Alabama State earlier in the season. And Monty Coleman told us yesterday, if he's got a lane open across the middle, quarterbacks are told to take it. This is Adrian Moore. And a tackle just bounced off of him. Gain of four yards on the play. Marcus White credited with the tackle. 
Yeah, some collisions down there taking place on the football field. You see him bouncing up and down right there after that big hit there. But this is what you like. You know, one team putting the challenge and then having your team respond back to the challenge. Good job by both of these teams and the coaches just willing their teams to compete in this game and make it a competitive second half. Boudreaux out of the shotgun. That's the spread offense they've installed this year, and they'll keep it on the ground. And that's a nice gain. It's Stephen Jones. He's normally the short yardage back. Well, he came in and he got some big yardage. Making the read there, running hard and tough in between the tackles. Is what you like to see a running back do. You'll see here, make the read there, give it to him. He's cutting up in the middle, getting in between the two safeties, and you've got Prairie View A&M forced to play cover two because they're so worried about the threat of the pass with Raymond Weber. Every time Weber comes off the field, they try and have at least two Prairie View defenders around him. When you play cover two, an offensive lineman will tell you, we've got to be able to run the ball effectively versus the seven-man front. Two tight ends in the game, but they run to the weak side. And that's Adrian Moore. Gain of four on the play for the junior. And it'll bring up uh, second down. Adrian Moore, interesting story. He's played three years of college football, but this is the first year he's actually played. Started out at Oak State, then went to Arkansas. Oklahoma State wanted to move him from running back to DB. Went to Arkansas. Was a walk-on there and never got put on scholarship, so came to Arkansas Pine Bluff. That's his second transfer, had to sit out a year. So he's a junior, but this is his first year where he's actually playing and seeing time on the field. Yeah, and they really like him. They think he's a fantastic football player, tremendous upside potential. That's Weber, and they find him on a lot of those slants and screens, and that was a quick out to him. And he gets eight yards on a first down. It's now first and goal. Chris Adingapu took him down. Yeah, one thing I like, that offensive coordinator Jerry Mack is doing for Arkansas Pine Bluff is, you know, you never see Raymond Weber line up in the same location. I mean, in consecutive plays, they'll line him up at the All over. They'll put him at Z. They'll put him in the slot. So it's a guessing game just where he's going to line up, let alone what defense you're going to try and play. All right, they're in the I formation here. One-on-one -on, -one on the outside. I think Boudreaux's taking a serious look at this. He may want to challenge the individual coverage on the outside. Yeah, and that's Weber, who's on the outside at the bottom of your screen. Boudreaux rolling to that side, and well, he rolled oh. right into a defender. They tricked him. You see what happened? They tricked him. The moment he made the adjustment to the fade route, they sent a safety out there. Now, what you've got to do is you've called the audible. It's a single man route. Max protection, get rid of it. Throw it right now. You don't get sagged down in the red zone. Once they got you, give credit to the defense for making a good adjustment. Throw it away. Keep your ball in, keep the ball inside the five-yard line where you continue to possibly run the football. Now, second and ten, you're basically forcing the hand. You've got to start passing. Good recognition there by the safety number one, Eric Moore, senior at San Bruno, California. Played at the City College of San Francisco before transferring to Prairie View. On second and goal, Boudreaux, the bootleg. Let's see if he can get the corner. And he gets to about the three-yard line, so it'll bring up third and goal. Boudreaux showing the athleticism. Now, I like the play selection. If you're going to have a right-handed quarterback rolling out to his left, give him plenty of field to do it. So often you'll see them call the bootleg to the short side of the field, and you turn around and the guy's right there. If you've got plenty of field to work, you can kind of go backwards if you need to in order to get rid of the ball, but good decision to run the football by Boudreaux. Tenth play of the drive. We just saw Raymond Weber jog to the sidelines. So you would think that this is probably some kind of a running play. Well, Loaded backfield, full house. This is Adrian Moore trying to push the pile. No signal yet from the stripes. And it'll bring up fourth down. He's short of the goal line. Yeah, they came out with the old Oklahoma type of option and just penetration in the backfield forced Moore to cut upfield sooner than he'd like. Tough for 19 that formation in a while. Yeah, you don't expect it from a team that normally runs a spread. They went full house there. And they don't really have a big power back on the roster. I mean, most, they only have one running back who weighs over 200 pounds. And Boudreaux trying to fire up this crowd and fire up his sideline. They're going to go for it here on fourth and goal from the one-yard line. And now a timeout on the field. On fourth and goal, so Arkansas Pine Bluff calling a timeout. 
It's fourth and goal here, and while we have a second, we'll remind you that ESPN News coverage of college football continues Saturday with a pair of games at 7 Eastern. The Eastern Michigan Eagles face the Vanderbilt Commodores. Then at 10.30 Eastern, we get to see Colin Kaepernick and Nevada. Uh, they'll be hosting San Jose State. It's college football primetime on ESPNU this Saturday. And Colin Kaepernick, his name not mentioned that often in the Heisman conversation, but those numbers speak of the imperative. Yeah, seventh in SBS and FBS and thousand yards throwing it, good touchdown interception ratio and well coached. I mean, he's really stepped up his game and you know, you know a guy really didn't get a lot of credit for his coaching acumen is Chris Alt. I mean, he's been in Nevada for decades and built that program over and over again, making him compete. Now they're ranking the top 25. Well, it originally looked like Arkansas Pine Bluff was going to go for it. They call timeout, and now on fourth and goal, they're bringing the kicking team out. And you saw Raymond Weber there on the sideline. Not exactly happy with the play call. But it's Monty Coleman's team, and it's his decision, and there's still a lot of football to be played. So they'll bring on Chris Ewald. He's already hit from 46. This one basically a point after. In fact, shorter than a point after. It's about a 19-yarder. Ewald boots it through, and Arkansas Pine Bluff now down just one. It's 7-6, Prairie View leading here in Pine Bluff. 6.43 to play in the third quarter. ESPNU College Football Primetime is brought to you by the new 2011 Lexus IS Wheel Precision. A one-point ball game here in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. As both teams scored in their opening possession of the second half. 7-6, Prairie View up by a point. Hi, that was Charlie Neal, the third member of our broadcast team, alongside Jay Walker, I'm Anish Shroff. Prairie View got the ball first in the second half, went seven plays, 74 yards, capped by a touchdown run by Donald Babers. Arkansas Pine Bluff answered right back. They got a chip shot field goal from Chris Ewald, and Ewald to kick it off. This is taken by Michael Benson, a couple of yards in his own end zone. Don't run it out. Benson. Across the 30 yard line, and he's taken down at the 31, a 34 yard return. And Prairie View AM with the football for the second time this half. So already two scores in the second half, only one field goal the entire first half. Yeah, let's go back and take a visit at that decision by Monty Coleman to go for the field goal. You know, I mean, you get emotionally caught up into it, you want to go for it, but I mean, think about it now. If you don't go for it, if you go for it and you miss it, you're down by four. Now, no matter what happens, you're still within one score. Yeah, you know, if, if they score a touchdown, touchdown, you're still within one score. So the right thing to do, even though the crowd might not have been a crowd-pleasing decision. Out of the eye formation. This is Babers oh, on first down. He's got daylight, but a flag on the play. And we know Babers can make guys miss in the open field. He might take this all the way. Actually, a touchdown saving tackle by Giovanni Harvey, but it might all be for naught. There's a flag back at the 44-yard line of the Panthers. I want to see the flag, because that flag came from deep in the secondary, and what I saw was a great pull and block by the fullback, Devin Brown, there. Blocking, blow the waist, toward the ball, number 18 on the offense, 15 yards from the spot of the foul, replay, first down. See, you know, this ain't number 18. I don't see a number 18 on the field. I don't I don't see it. You know, I saw I saw Devin Brown come around there and do a great job of blocking. You see the talk about Walter Payton and the swack, the sifter on there, a la sweetness there. Oh, good job. But oh, that's a tough one there. I just I don't know where that call came from. That would have been a 65 yard play. Instead, it's going to be first and long after this penalty. So they'll knock it back. 10 yards and it'll be first down and 20 for Prairie View. And there's Henry Frazier, the head coach, and boy, what a turnaround he's authored for this Panther football team. This was a school that hadn't had a winning season since 1976 prior to 07. There's Black. And he skips that one. 
Intended for Sean Stevens. Here's that last play again, Jay. Tell us what you right, see. Let's take a look. They called the low block here, number 80 That's there. Brandon Bell. That's Brandon Bell, number 80. Going low. Looked like the guy was embracing. I mean, I've seen lower. We've definitely seen lower. That wasn't done with malicious intent. And Babers made a good job. Bell came in there, got low. I mean, wow. I mean, are you really going low if you hit a guy on, on the knee to thigh? You know, kind of inside that box, too. You know, there's a rule if they get inside that box and it looks like he was inside the tackle box. Ooh, that's one that they'll have to go over that when they do the SWAC official meetings in the morning. <laughs> On second down and long. Black throws, caught by Stevens. And that's a first down. That's a way to get it all back. That was a great throw there. Well, they ran a clear out route and had Stevens come underneath and Michael Benson ran up the seam and then you're going to see Sean Stevens come underneath the route cleared out and the most time you call that play you call it for you know 13 14 yard gain. You don't see too many teams calling it 18 yards plus but when you've got a quarterback with that type of arm strength you can extend and stretch the defense. Six catches now for Stevens is up to 32 on the season had 36 all of last year. Babers on first down and he gets across midfield and into Pine Bluff territory. Jarvis Webb made the tackle again five yards on the play and boy right now every time Babers touches the ball there's a feeling not only in the press box but in the stands below that he might do something big. Yeah that edge of the seat that we're always talking about and they're trying to feed him and setting up his runners and they're doing a good job with their fullback. They moved Devin Brown to the fullback position. He plays running back but they've got him as a lead blocker. And, you know coach Frazier talked about right now we've got a patchwork offense. I mean everybody's banged up. Stoney Owens is starting again because the regular center got a broken leg against Grambling State. Then they've got their right tackle Jamar Cawley number 74. He's starting because of an instant injury to Preston Langston. So you've got two guys that haven't been starting all season long but schematically they've got such a strong running scheme that they're able to get effective running and Donald Babers just really coming out to play in the second half. Yeah, it's third and four after that last run by Babers. Stevens with six catches lined up near the bottom. And Black throws it his way and that's a catch and it's a Panther first down. And see that's one of the throws where every time we've seen him kind of go to the left with that pass he's always been a little low and I think when you're a quarterback and you're trying to do a quick three step drop you got to get that left leg that's your point leg your directional leg aims your throw and I think he's having trouble coming around the left leg and he's very inaccurate with those throws to the left side that are short because he can't step into the throw. Coach has told us Stevens was the go to guy in the passing game and up to seven catches already. This is a give to Babers and he may have gotten a yard. It's the freshman again, Jerian Harris, who is in on the stop. And not only is Jerian Harris a very good football player, I mean, he brings a little pack to the punch. I mean, his Knows tackles the ball, are though, vicious. He seems, I mean, every fourth play, he's there. Yeah, I mean, he hits you and he hurts you, and he plays football the good old-fashioned way where he's not just trying to make tackles. He's trying to make those punishing tackles. And 6'1", 210 pounds now, and they say he's got small upper body big lower body base and he's got room to expand that frame. He's only a freshman. How scary is that? Yeah. And he was a guy who the team really didn't envision to be much of an impact player this year. Not that they didn't have high hopes for him but Antonio Harding was supposed to start. He tore his Achilles and that gave Harris a chance to start and he's led the team in tackles in every game. In fact he leads the swack in tackles per game coming into this contest. On second down this is Devin Brown. So they finally give Babers a bit of a breather and Brown you mentioned he's a fullback but he's had to take on some running back duties because Calvin Guyton who is the backup running back is out with a knee injury and Guyton didn't play the last two weeks so that means Brown has to carry the football a little more and by the way guess who made that last tackle. Let me guess number 51 51 <laughs> Ryan Harris. Harris. Uh, he's just really all over the football. One thing you are starting to notice though the Prairie View offensive line is starting to figure out the run. Uh, the running blocks that they need to make and the linebackers are having to make the play so you're not getting too many defensive tackles making plays anymore. And o line another unit that's banged up. Black gets that one off to Stevens shakes one tackler and then hurdles out of bounds another first down a flag comes in at the end of the play and it should it's good for 15 yards but let's see what the penalty is. Yeah uh, a late hit uncalled for completely away from the ball 
Winston Dotsman, number 39, just went over in debt. One of the linebackers from Arkansas Pine Bluff. Actually, it was Brandon Thurman, I think he decked number 55. Official saw it, I saw it, just completely uncalled for. It was at least 20 yards away from the play. George McCullum's a referee. Let's see what he says. After the play was over, personal foul, number 39, on offense. The play was a first down. We'll penalize 15 down. It'll be first and 10. Let's take a look at this. I mean, the play's going to your left. And you're going to see the fullback come, Dossman, after the play. Spin move on the outside. The play's completely over. It's way behind them, and they call the flag. And that is two times on this drive that Prairie View has had a big play taken back because of a penalty. Remember, that was that 65-yard run by Babers that was negated because of a block in the back, and now that late hit on Dossman. Here's Babers. And he gets to about the 32-yard line. It'll bring up second down. Two twenty-three to go here in this third quarter. Not a lot of offense in the first half. Just one field goal by Pine Bluff's Chris Ewald. It was three-nothing Golden Lions at halftime. But Arkansas Pine Bluff has added another field goal here in the second half in Prairie View on its first possession of the third quarter. Marks downfield 74 yards for a touchdown. They're in Pine Bluff territory again. Black throwing downfield. He's got a man wide open, but he overthrew Spencer Nelson. A flag, though, flies in at the 21 yard line. Should be a hold there. Play was breaking down, a little double move, and I believe one of the defensive linemen from Pine Bluff that was actually dropping the, that recognized the screen saw the wide receiver taking off and just grabbed him. During the pass, pass interference on the defense, number 20, 15 yards from the previous five, first down. So a first down after that pass interference penalty for Prairie View AM, and m and that's a penalty that goes their way. It's Duplachain, the senior out of Texas, flagged for that pass interference. And was that a pass interference? Was that a hold? Yeah, I think it was a hold pass interference, you know. Potato, potato, tomato, tomato. But one way or the other, the defense was doing something they weren't supposed to do. And they just got caught. They had the play sniffed out. But once the wide receiver turned and cut up field, they realized either give up a touchdown or give up a first down. On first down, it's a give. It's Devin Brown. And he gets two yards on the play. Jeremy Morrow. Made the tackle and Brown, as you mentioned, a fullback who's now seeing some carries because of the injury to Calvin Guyton. Coaches say this guy's a bruiser. Played the most snaps he's played all season last week, and right now it looks like he's giving Babers a little bit of a breather. 12th play of the drive, ball to 14. Black under pressure, swings it out, and it's through the hands of Brown, but a flag. Coming in at the end of the play, a lot of penalties on this drive, a lot of yellow. It's been sloppy on both sides. And, you know, Prairie View's managed to keep the drive alive in spite of some of their shortcomings. Defense lined up in the neutral zone, number 91, five yards, replay, second down. So that's Theodore McNeil. He recovered a fumble earlier in this game, and that neutral zone infraction pushes the ball up to about the nine yard line, so it'll be second down and three. Uh, if I'm Arkansas Pine Bluff right now, we want to try and stop the run, but you got to know where number two is, Sean Stevens. He's the only wide receiver that's got a touchdown for Prairie View a &M, so it'd be a good idea to get two defenders around him. This is Babers. He's got one touchdown already. There's the stiff arm, but he was too close to the sideline, and James Harrell forced him out of bounds. Well, that's one of those ones we talk about where he saw daylight, but he didn't see the two black jerseys behind. Babers going to get here. Room too. Wants to bounce it outside. Think I've got, oh, no, he slips off a block, and he's got another safety right there behind him playing outside force. Nowhere to go. Jay, for a guy that's his size and as quick as he is, are you impressed by his ability to break tackles and the way he uses that stiff arm? He doesn't run like a little guy. I mean, he no. runs like a power back, and he thinks he's bigger than he really is, and that's a good trait to have. I mean, you don't just go down easy with initial contact. 
very impressive. He's got the size of a scat back, but he's got the ability to run like a power rusher. 5'10", 190, that's what he's listed at in the media guy. Black has time, steps up, throws, completes. Benson diving. And he's going to be just short of the goal line. They're going to mark him out of bounds at the one yard line, but it brings up a first and goal. And the Panthers with a chance to tack onto a 7 6 lead here. And you see KJ Black buying a little time, stepping up in the pocket, making the throw across his body, and the rest is just a great individual effort. Good hop, skip, and a jump. He tried to get in there, but they said his initial leg that he planted from was out of bounds. We'll take a look. We should get a good look here. I don't know if that was out of bounds. <laughs> I think he scored a touchdown. That was a great effort, Michael Benson. You've got a right to be a little hot. Brown and Babers in the backfield. Black this time lines up under center. He fumbled. He fumbled the snap. The Golden Lions saying that they have the football. And they do a costly turnover. And boy, now that touchdown that they didn't call. Yeah, potentially missed call it. Call it, you know, may have been a touchdown or Benson dove for the goalposts. Boy, that's a game changer. Wow, it's upset because the Prairie View offensive lineman came out of the pile with the ball. He just fumbled the snap. He had never had it. He came from, from behind the center and didn't have it. Once it's down there, it's anybody's ball. Coach Fraser's just saying, man, last year when Come we were on, nine man. and one, we didn't even have anything like this happen to us. And when your team is struggling a little bit, you never catch the breaks. That's why the football is not round. It's oblong. Yeah, the football gods, they've certainly presented some challenges on a lot of fronts for Prairie View, be it injuries, be it bad luck. Right now, Pine Bluff just trying to get out of the shadow of its own goalposts, looking for a little breathing room there on first down. And that's going to bring us to the end of the third quarter. We got a good one here in Arkansas. It's 7-6 Prairie View on top of Pine Bluff. We'll come back for a fantastic 15 minutes. 7-6 going into the fourth. Bring it in. As we start the fourth quarter, let's look at tonight's game summary brought to you by State Farm. The first half was a story of sacks on both sides of the ball. But then the second half started off with Prairie View going all the way down the field. Babers scoring the touchdown, and here's a big fumble as Prairie View was trying to put in their second touchdown of the evening. As we look at our State Farm game summary, Donald Babers, you see what he's done so far tonight, over 100 yards rushing. Weber with his reception, six for 66 yards and total yards for Prairie View 248 Arkansas Pine Bluff 165 now let's go back upstairs to Nietzsche and Jay. All right thank you Charlie Arkansas Pine Bluff to start the fourth quarter facing a second and eight ball on its own five they recovered a fumble Prairie View coughing it up on a first and goal to end the third quarter. It's a run on first down and that's John Tony. 5'9 sophomore who went to the same high school as another running back on this team, Justin Billings, and he gets maybe two. This will bring up third down. You notice that total offense for Arkansas Pine Bluff. They've had 165 yards total offense. I mean, how many yards did Boudreaux have by himself last week throwing the ball? You know, Boudreaux last week, yeah, he had Quite plus a game. Three, yeah, plus 300 yards passing. 366 yards passing. And now you come here, And now they've been shut down. So a little bit different once you step up the level of competition within your conference. So the measuring stick game we talked about for this Pine Bluff, offensively, they have not met the challenge. This Boudreaux's is going to keep it on third down, and he looks to have a first down. That was a busted play. John Mark Henderson. Shoved him out of bounds, but not before. It's another first down for the Golden Lions. Ah, no, that was in good old fashioned naked. You know, so often you call misdirection of the bootleg or play action. That was a naked bootleg. That's either fool him or get hit in the mouth. Gutsy call there. And fortunately for Arkansas Pine Bluff, the Panthers from Prairie View and m took the bait. Nothing but daylight on the outside. Tell you what, both teams have been able to move the ball here in the second half. Prairie View on its first drive went 74 yards for a score. Arkansas Pine Bluff came back 
with a field goal. Prairie View on its next possession got all the way down to the one yard line before fumbling and Arkansas Pine Bluff started deep in its own zone but able to get a first down. Right now there's an injured player on the field and that's who they're tending to. It's Keith Hutchins on Pine Bluff. Actually, you know, it's, uh, that's, Niedemeyer. that's Brad Niedemeyer. Yeah, it's the tight end out of Alaska. He was that lead blocker there on that last one. He was the only guy. That's where they play him sometimes is that H back. Look at that. Got the, well, he's blending in well. Got the UAPB carved up on the side of his hair. It's a run here on first down. And that is John Tony. Gain of eight yards on the play. Max Century coming up to make the play. No, I got to get I was right. going to say, yeah, you, you did a little homework. I, I did a little homework, and I must apologize. I butchered the name so bad. The official name of M4, which is the Arkansas Pine Bluff Band, M4, the acronym, Marching Musical Machine of the Mid-South. How about that? M4. M4. Easier to say M4. A lot of alliteration. <laughs> On second down, and that's a loss of yards. It was Tony again who got the call, but he goes backwards. Raheem Cardwell yeah, yeah. making the play. And that's what you do. He's got the fullback coming, and that's what you do. Great individual effort. Mano y mano, hit the fullback, locate the running back, take his legs from underneath him. Another piece of trivia, our uh, spotter, Adam Alter, did some homework. Arkansas Pine Bluff that used to be called Arkansas A N and N Agricultural Mechanic Mechanical and Normal, which uh, means it was a teaching school. Okay. There's a flag on the play here on third and six. Figured we just hit all the trivia out right there. <laughs> Illegal substitution on the offense. Five yard penalty. Replay. Third down. George McCollum, the uh, head referee, breathing heavy there. Hey, I mean, you know, type of game you got to be in shape, ripping and running up there. Yeah. You get down there and try it. Uh, I, I, that's why I'm up here. <laughs> <laughs> it is definitely easier than it looks, Anish. Easier than it looks. Grass is always greener somewhere else. <laughs> Third and six now from the 14, four receiver set. Boudreaux. Throws and it's complete. That's to his tailback, Adrian Moore. But well, that's going to be short of the first down. So instead, it'll be fourth down. And if you're Prairie View, yeah, you fumbled on first and goal. But now, at least you've got the field position game won here in the fourth quarter. Yeah, but they much rather would have had those well, seven points they left on the ball on the board. First and goal from the one yard line, and you fumble. I mean. I'm trying to be the optimist here. <laughs> Good try, but you, you can't fake it all the time. Sometimes you got to say what it is, and it is what it is. Missed opportunity. High snap to Kent Black. Just gets it off, and that one is a low line drive that torpedoes out of bounds. Prairie View will take over inside Pine Bluff territory when we come back. ESPN College Football Primetime is presented by McDonald's. I'm loving it. Let's take a look at the road ahead for HBCU football. Brought to you by Lexus. A couple of big games coming up in the Southwestern Athletic Conference this weekend. And we start with the Braves of Alcorn State. They'll be trying to rebound from that loss last Saturday as they host Texas Southern for homecoming. Also, Alabama State will go up against the Tigers of Grambling State. But one of the biggest games in black college football this season is a Division II game. It takes place in Columbus, Georgia as the SIC defending champ Tuskegee takes on Morehouse and what makes this a big game for Morehouse they're five and zero, oh, and off to their best start in 80 years ironically back in 1930 when Morehouse went nine and one their only loss was to Tuskegee and guess what it came in the sixth game of the season gentlemen uh oh now here's one for you the game between Morehouse and Tuskegee it's a classic what's it called Anish Boy, you're just hitting me with trivia today, pal. <laughs> Unique name. It's called the Skeegee House Classic. Come on, you could have figured that out. 
tell you about, you know, the oaken bucket <laughs> and Paul Bunyan's axe. Giving you a little flavor. You are. A little flavor. I'm learning. Got Professor Jay. Got a historian in Charlie Neal down on the field. This is Donald Babers on first Fumble. Down. And he lost the football. Wow. Golden Lions say they have it. And, wow, that would be two plays and two turnovers for Prairie View A&M. It is indeed a turnover. Number 55, Brandon Thurman came up with it. Let's see what happens. It's going to take place at the end of the run as he's going down for extra yardage. Ball's going to come out clean. He's going to try and pull forward. They've got a hand on the ball, and it's out. And guess who was in on the fumble again? None other than the freshman, Jerian Harris. He forced the first fumble in this game. That was in the first half. So he's now forced two fumbles. And for Prairie View, this is its third turnover of the game. So Pine Bluff gets it right back. Justin Billings taken down for a loss on first down. Negative three on the play. Chris Adingapu, or rather uh, Brent Gordon, making the stop. Yeah, you know, and I know if you're Coach Frazier over there, you got to be thinking to yourself, this just doesn't happen to teams that are 9-1. and one. Last year, we never did things like this. But what a difference a year makes, different campaign. Not catching the same breaks. You know, football's a game where you say the same things that make you laugh, they'll also make you cry. Second and long now for Pine Bluff. Boudreaux, there's the pressure. He airs it out. The intended receiver, Raymond Weber, but just maybe a stride too far. Yeah, they, they shrunk the window on him. You know, earlier on, he had plenty of space, room to run around, and they were playing a traditional cover, too. Now they're playing a, a traditional one guy underneath, one guy over the top. And if you're going to try and stick that ball in there, instead of having about 10 room window, you can get the ball to him. Now you've got about a five yard window. And Jay, that's not really their offense, throwing the ball downfield. They like to get the ball to Weber and screens and on slants where he has some space and he can do the rest with his legs. The part of the problem is you got a sound fundamental team like Prairie View that likes to make good tackles and they're good tackles and they've always got somebody close on the line of scrimmage. Third and 13, that looked like a zone blitz that time from Prairie View. John Mark Henderson tackles Raymond Weber. Yep. Is that his own blitz there? Bump and run, man to man coverage. So he's with them from the beginning. He's man to man. His guy. Well, it looks like the D line was dropping back there, though. And so they tried to do that, but you had the man to man coverage. And if you've got a wide receiver screen call on bump and run coverage, pretty tough because he's going to be right there with them, trailing the whole time. So. And they also did drop some of the D linemen back on that play, too. Fourth down now, another punt coming up for Kent Black. Ball snapped over his head, but a whistle was blown before the ball was even snapped. Prior to the snap, false start, number 22, five yards, replay, fourth down. Yeah, Charles Williams called for offsides there, so back him up five yards further. I don't know what. Kent Black came in averaging about 35 yards per punt. Spencer Nelson is waiting at his own 36-yard line. This one is over the head of Nelson. And it bounces into the end zone for a touchback. There was some contact down inside the five-yard line, but it'll go as a touchback, a 66-yard punt. And remember, coverage of ESPN Rise High School football continues. This Friday, we showcase the future stars of football today. ESPN Rise High School football showcase presented by the U.S. Marines on ESPNU Friday at 8 Eastern. You can log on to ESPNRise.com for more information. Let's see Driscoll, highly talented quarterback, on his way to Florida next year. Number one quarterback prospect in the nation. So get an opportunity to see some good quarterback. K.J. Black back out from Prairie View. Their last two offensive plays resulted in a pair of fumbles and two turnovers. Play action here. Black under pressure, finally slings it out. It's caught by Stevens, and he turned what looked like broken play into a gain of about five. You talk about having time to go through all your reads and progression. Starts with a great protection on the right. Look at James Plant, number seven. He just stonewalling his guy rushing. They give up pursuit. Black can spin out, 
keep his vision downfield, find somebody to throw the ball to, and turn something, turn nothing into something. Picked up positive yards on first down, five yard completion. Panthers nursing a one point lead as we come up on nine minutes to play in the fourth quarter. This is Babers on second and five, and it'll bring up a third and one as he gets four right there. And Jay, we talked about this throughout the broadcast, Prairie View two and three, not where they wanted to be after winning a SWAC title last year. Well, you know, it's funny, expectations, a new thing for this program. Yeah. <laughs> you were telling me when you played at Howard back in the early 90s, well, this Prairie View team was seen as a laughing stock among yep. black college football, right? I mean, not just among black college football. straight losses, yeah, football was, in general. Football in general, and, you know, it kind of spread. You know, you kept losing. You've got the longest losing streak in the nation. Doesn't matter what level of football you're talking about. 80 games in a row, 1989 to 1998. Everybody knew about it. You know, I will say this about Prairie. I mean, this is a little fact most people don't recognize. When First they, down by Stevens there. When, when they had the longest losing streak in the country, they were non-scholarship football. That's a good point. And they were in the SWAC where every other team, every team had scholarships except for Prairie View. So once they started getting the, the scholarships then, and they increased it time and time again, now they're full scholarships and there's no looking back. They got a brand new on-campus facility that's coming that they're excited about. So I think Prairie View football is here to stay. A low point 91. They scored 48 points all season, gave up an average of 56 <laughs> per game. Let that sink in. They scored 48 for the year, and they averaged giving up 50. Wow. This is fumble. And another fumble. A flag comes in on the play. Looks like Devin Brown recovered for Prairie View AM. Fumble recovered by the Panthers. Last play. This is coming back. Holy offense. Number 50, 10 yards from the previous five. Replay, first down. They got the center, Stoney Owens. Let's see if Babers has this ball wrapped tight. I mean, when you're in there, you want to get two hands on it. Ah, uh, yeah. Oof. I mean, you know, Jerian, there he was again. Jerian Harris again. He's a player. Put that arm in there, got that ball out of there. But, you know, that ball gets a little low on your knee pad with one hand. You know, linebackers and defensive linemen can just put those big, heavy arms in there. I don't think he has enough physical strength to hold on that ball with one hand in traffic. Black again to Stevens. He's lit up by Giovanni Harvey. He got about four on the play. You know, 4-3 defense playing some soft coverage. He's just reacting on the ball. The moment he saw the quarterback release the throw, throwing wide side across the whole field, had time to react and put a good pop. On Stevens, good cover by Giovanni Harvey. 11 catches now for Stevens. And you go back to what we were talking about a moment ago about how this Prairie View AM program turned itself around. Well, Henry Frazier, the man in charge, has a lot to do with that. When he first showed up, this school had won one game the previous year. Well, Frazier got things turned around pretty quickly. They won nine games in a SWAT title last year. That pass is dropped. Spencer Nelson couldn't hang on and boy Frazier sort of seen as a miracle worker taking this program from the dark ages into the Renaissance think about this in 07 the Panthers went seven and three first winning season since 1976 and in his first two seasons he won eight games the previous 13 seasons they won nine games all together yeah he really talk about changing around. a culture and then I mean we're back to back nine win seasons you know the, although they won the SWAC championship last season the year before in 2008 also they also won nine games and missed out on another championship by just one game with a loss to Grambling so it's not like they just had a fluke season they've been good for a couple years now Black throws downfield Stevens goes up and what gets it. uh but catch. they say he didn't catch it they say he was out of oh Boy, that was right in front of the Panther bench, and they're not too happy about that call. He climbed the ladder. I thought K.J. Black overthrew him. Watch him go up, give up his body, know he's going to get hit, get spun around. That right leg, did it come out inbounds? And let's take a look at it. Ah. Oh. Well, it didn't look like he had control of the football there coming down. Well, I will tell you, this is a fantastic individual effort. Well, they're saying it's a catch now. They're saying it's a he catch. hit. The official ruling, you that saw that foot is down. Hands down, yeah. They're saying it's that a catch. That foot came down first. 
can't review plays at the FCS level, not in the regular season at least. Yeah, they're yeah, don't, saying don't it's look a catch. at the right. Don't look at the right foot. That's going out of bounds. It's the left foot that's swinging that you can't see. That gets in first, and that's in bounds. One foot in, in college football. So it's a catch, and Stevens now over the century mark in receiving yards. Black. Oh, you saw that coming. Abdullah again, but a flag comes back at the 48-yard line, and there's a man down on the field. Fifth sack for this Golden Lion defense. Holy offense. Number seven, 10 yards from the previous spot. Replay, first down. Penalty on James Blanton. We're trying to find out who the injured player down on the field is. As Henry Frazier looks on concern, and it's number 75, Tim Tussey. He's an all-conference left tackle. 6'3", 280-pound sophomore, getting up slowly. And they've already got a banged-up line that we talked about earlier. you got two guys that are starting in this game just because of injury. Sure. Now you got your left tackle has been your steady rock, Tim Tussey, going to the sideline. So, oh. You know, if you're Coach Frazier, you know what you say? <laughs> when I was going on my way to a 9 and one season, things like this didn't happen. Got we all the breaks. Healthy. You got all the breaks. We didn't lose anybody. <laughs> Frazier's an interesting guy. He is sort of like Al Golden, who we had a chance to meet with when we did the Temple Central Michigan game last month. And Golden sort of treats football as a business, a CEO-like mentality. And that was sort of how Frazier got this program turned around. A lot of accountability involved doesn't exactly put in the long hours of the office he's good at delegating but he produces and he gets results i'll tell you interesting and he fact. said his coordinators don't leave him because his wives love him because he doesn't make him work late <laughs> this is devin brown and he goes right up the middle on first and long and four now here's a little fact about henry frage i can let you know and he's been kind of keeping us under wraps yeah you know he likes to he believes in education he said you know for me i got to be a role model to my children so he's got his master's degree and so he said he wants to tell the kids you know master's degree in my profession may not help me with my earning power but as a coach but he's six credits away from becoming doctor Henry Dr. Frazier. Henry Frazier. So he's working on his doctorate degree, and he said, you know, I've got to practice what I'm preaching. Football may be taken away from me one day, but if I've got that doctor's in education management, then maybe I can work in the NFL. Maybe and on I the other sideline, you have yeah. Monty Coleman, who's a minister. Yes. <laughs> Educated men coaching these young men. This is Brown again going to the outside, and he stopped a couple of Panthers or a couple of Golden Lions, including Derek Timber. Getting him around. He was trying to go east-west. He's more of a north-south guy. He's a northwest, north-south guy. But you know, with all that being said about education, all that stuff, you know what Henry Frazier wants right now? He wants a first down. That's he wants first to down. Get he wants to get out board. of here with a win and get to 500. I mean, yeah, if he can get. They really need to win this game to stay in the hunt for a SWAC West Division title. Yeah, you know, and he's thought about this. He said, "Hey, if we went out, we go eight and three. You know, we got the loss uh, to Southern Mississippi." And if we, we take that. Also lost to Grambling, which could hurt Grambling, him down the road. Down the road, but if Grambling wins out, he's saying, hey, the FCS playoffs are expanding to 20 teams. You know, there are going to be four teams that normally wouldn't get in there. We may have a decent score. Black got a great block in the backfield, and he has time to complete the pass to Brandon Bell along the near sideline. Ooh, th this is going to be the time right here. What do you do now? What do you do? I mean, Bell caught that ball about a yard short of the first down maybe two this part of the field i think you go for it you go for the win right now well two plays come to mind from the early season in college football one was that arkansas alabama game nick saban had the ball at his own 45 fourth and inches he went for it and the other was michigan state last week that was against wisconsin they went for it on fourth and goal late got the touchdown made it a 10-point game right now it's a seven six game and they're going for it here on fourth and goal, or fourth down, and uh, two. Uh, no, they're not. And apparently they were just trying to draw the other team off sides. They'll take a delay a game penalty. On the offense, number seven, five yards. Replay, fourth down. Fourth down. Mm. Well, listen, this defense has held Arkansas Pine Bluff to two field goals. Here's what we have to remember, though. 
What did Monty Coleman tell us about his kicker, Chris Hewall? Yeah. He can make long field goals, 50-55. If it comes down to a 54-55 yard kick with little time left, he'll take it. Yes, yeah, so and maybe maybe Prairie Vinanian knew that and didn't want to risk giving them the ball right here, thinking two first downs, they can beat us. Yeah. But the key is where your special teams capitalize and oh, the, the goal line special teams unit inside their 15-yard line. Then turn to punt again. Two returners for Pine Bluff. It won't matter. This one sails oh, out of bounds. That's a great kick. That's a, that's a good angle Well, that's kick. not going to be a touchback. We'll see where they spot it. And he'll spot it at the 11-yard line. 89 yards to go for a touchdown for Pine Bluff. But they just need a field goal. Down 7-6. 3-10 to play in the ballgame. Welcome to McDonald's. May I take your order? Yeah, uh, we'll have... Uh... I'll take a Walmart gift card so I can buy a bunch... With three minutes and ten seconds left here in the ball game, Prairie View holding on to a one-point lead, seven to six, over the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. And earlier we asked you a Facebook question, and the Facebook question was, who do you feel that was a former SWAC player had the best NFL career? Was it Jerry Rice? Was it Walter Payton? Or was it this man, Steve McNair? Well, you voted. Here's the way you responded. Jerry Rice with 44% of the vote, Walter Payton with 24, Steve McNair with 15%. Does that surprise you guys upstairs? Well, you know, I'll say this. Walter Payton let's go. Let's go. Let's no longer with us and hasn't let's played go. in a long time. I think Jerry Rice still fresh in a lot of people's minds, not just because of how he played. Is That's a low snap. Boudreaux picks it up, and he's just going to go down inside his own two-yard line, so that's not how Arkansas Pine Bluff wants to start this drive down one with less than three minutes to go. But, you know, to go back to Jerry Rice dancing with the stars, I think that put him fresh in a lot of people's minds. That was yep. just a few years ago. The only, only surprise I don't see there, you know, we always judge people by winners. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, one of the greatest winners is uh, the only African-American to win a Super Bowl. That quarterback was Doug Williams. Not see Doug Williams there was kind of surprising me, but different generation. All right, big play coming up here. Second and long, five wide, empty backfield for Boudreaux. So if someone's coming after him, he's got no one to block. If they get past the front five. Boudreaux oh, flings it out, and it's picked off. Ah. Intercepted by Raheem Caldwell, the redshirt freshman, off the deflection. And there was nobody back to block for him in the backfield. They came after him. Pass was tipped. And a turnover, the first turnover of the game for Pine Bluff. You know, cover two, you've, they lined up Weber in the slot. You've got somebody on the outside and John Mark Henderson. You've got somebody in the slot playing inside. So what you've got to do is you can't throw that ball. That's just where you can't go with the football. So Prairie View with the football and a one-point lead, just 218 left to play in Pine Bluff. Possible. Prairie View up 7-6. They got the ball back thanks to an interception on the last play from Arkansas Pine Bluff. Yeah, they're playing cover two. When you got cover two, they've got the inside receiver slotted right there. So once he breaks outside, the guy just peels off, comes underneath the route. One tip guy, that defender missed it, but he had the inside slot linebacker there to help make the play. You know, as a quarterback, you got to know cover two, I can't throw out routes because somebody's there. All right, let's talk a little strategy now. Panthers have the ball with a one-point lead, five yards to go. If you're Monty Coleman, do you just let them score and try to get the ball back and give your offense more time? Because even if they get a touchdown and hit the extra point, it's still a one-score game. Yeah, I think I think you look at the timeout situation. It's like there, video game so. strategy here, let them score, right? <laughs> it is one. I would say, you know, you don't let them score the touchdown because you don't want to have to score a touchdown to beat them. Well, you're going to need one if they kick the field goal, so... I don't think you put up too much resistance, but you see what your timeouts are going to do for you as well. If you had three timeouts, you would, you definitely wouldn't do it. But now I think you know they should start calling these timeouts. Let them kick the field goal. And you may have enough time to go ahead and uh, give yourself a chance for a kickoff return. They have two timeouts. Jerian Harris with another tackle, taking down Devin Brown, and it will bring up second down. And Pine Bluff just burned its second timeout, trying to stop the clock. With 209 to go. Don't forget Saturday morning ESPNU previews a busy day in college football at 9 a.m. Eastern. Aaron Andrews joins the game day crew and hosts college game day built by the Home Depot. Then at 10 a.m. Eastern, it's the college football version of Sports Nation. And at 11 a.m. Eastern, get the latest news from all the big game sites on college football whip around. 
Don't miss a single moment on ESPNU Saturday. And here's your full slate of games for this upcoming college football Saturday. Virginia Tech at home, Georgia Tech and Joshua Nesbitt. Boy, they were the defending ACC champs. Haven't looked so good in the early season. They have not, and Mike London's had a little bit more difficulty jump starting that Virginia Cavalier team. Got pounded by Florida State, so they've got to get it going as well, too. And stay up to watch Nevada. Colin Kaepernick, one of the best quarterbacks in the country. We showed you earlier his numbers right up there with Denard Robinson. Not at that level, but not too far behind. They're going to throw here on second down and a touchdown. Ooh. Now that debate goes. Did, Michael did Benson. Score? Did they do him a favor scoring? So now you know they're going to need a touchdown. But now you let them keep a timeout as well, too. So they're going to have plenty of clock and a timeout. They got to drive the length of the field. So. And they'll still have a timeout, as you mentioned. Yeah. I think that's going to be big. So now this extra point actually looms pretty large. Because if they miss this, well, now you only need a touchdown and a PAT to tie. Remember, if he makes this, then Arkansas Pine Bluff needs not only the touchdown, but the two-point conversion. But they've got plenty of time. Two minutes in college football is a lot of time, considering they stop the clock after first down. Stepping out of bounds, so they've got an eternity. So I understand the call because you don't want to have an incomplete pass because that would have stopped the clock. But they call the conservative play call extended handoff, just a little swing. It's like a running play here. But he got in so easily inside out. Plenty of time on the clock there. So could be interesting. So it is 14 to 6 Prairie View on top with 2.04 to go. And we take this time to remind you that ESPN News coverage of college football continues Saturday with a pair of games, Eastern Michigan at Vandy. That's a 7 p.m. start. And then San Jose State visiting 21st ranked Nevada. That game in Reno. And again, a showcase game as we get to see Colin Kaepernick. We'll be up late for that. Would also like to plug ESPN goal line if you have that. 12 hours of college football on Saturday. We'll basically take you from game to game. We're your remote control. We change the channel for you. Have fun doing that. A lot. It's a lot of fun. You get to watch basically every college football game every Saturday. See, that's the difference between the ball player, and, you know, and the, and the <laughs> talent, the suit. You know, guy like me, 12 hours college football. How can you not have fun watching and talking ball? You know, you uh, can be interesting. Oh, it's, you're going you're you're to go. You're going to go. You're going to go that way on me. That's the difference. I love that. I get to see every touchdown scored in America. That's the dream job. It is, man. It's, it's get it. That's the dream job. <laughs> All right, it's a short squib kick, and Pine Bluff is going to have terrific field position wow. to start. Brandon Miner, who's a backup defensive back, fielded that squib kick. Oh, no. You, you Make it Adam Trotter, and boy, what's the logic there? Uh, uh, no logic at all. He just missed it. I mean, he, he had to have just missed that. Now they get the ball. I mean, even this imagine your worst case scenario, you get one first down. You. You, you, you can make the attempts at the end zone. Hell, Mary passes. You got quarterbacks throw the ball 65 yards in the air. So, oh, wow. Ball on the 44 yard line. Boudreaux under pressure. Has room if he wanted to run. Instead, he'll sling it out. And that's a big gain. And a first down for Arkansas Pine Bluff. Davian Woodfin with the catch out of the backfield. Yeah, good job by Boudreaux. The good size, able to step through the arm tackle to get out the pocket, vision down the field, found a guy wide open in the flat and Woodfin, and then you get the first down. So now you've got plenty of time. You can be in a rush, but don't hurry. The clock stopped for a little while. They still get to keep a timeout. Boudreaux again on the run. And he's just going to heave this one out of bounds. This was a 3 nothing game at halftime. We've seen a lot of scoring in the second half. Prairie View on its opening drive of the third quarter went down the field and made it 7-3, a seven-play, 74-yard drive capped by a uh, Babers touchdown run. With Jay Walker, I'm Anish Shroff. Again, we're at Golden Lion Stadium in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Charlie Neal down on the sideline with us. ESPN New College Football Primetime presented by McDonald's. And here we are. Second and 10, 127 to go. Boudreaux throws off his back foot. It's complete. 
Chris Bolton inside the 30 yard line. It's a first down. Remember, Sports Center U coming up following the game. Yeah, that's several times they've had that softness in the middle of that zone defense by Prairie View. They're going with the cover two, finding a wide receiver, settling in the zone. Pass rush is not getting there, so Boudreaux is just having easy picking right now on the Panther defense. Pine Bluff still has one timeout left. Boudreaux again steps up, throws, and it's picked oh. off. Overshot his man. It's intercepted by Brennan Gordon. Well, this is going to be a touchdown. And he's going to go the length of the field. There's a lineman downfield, but he's blocked, and Gordon stumbles into the end zone. A 77-yard interception return, and Prairie View has gone up 20 to six. Stepped up in the pocket and just made an inaccurate throw. I mean, had a crossing route. Guy was running wide open, but the step up, inaccurate throw, high, half-hearted effort by the wide receiver to knock that ball down. The next thing you know, this game's going to start to appear like a blowout rather than the close contest it was for three and three quarters of a quarter. Say that three and three quarters of a game. That's Brennan Gordon, a former transfer from TCU. <laughs> And the senior, a 77-yard interception return, and Prairie View's defense has given them a 21-6 lead. Cordera Frazier was the intended receiver on that last throw by Boudreaux, but listen, you got to give the defense a little credit there. They flushed him out of the pocket, made him throw on the move, and that was just a high throw. Yeah, just a poor throw. Second pick of the game. Got away from him, and, you know, you would like for it to get a little bit better effort from the wide receiver. Cross him out right here in your face, and he just missed behind. Really nothing the receiver could do. Let me take the blame off of him, and I'm sure Boudreaux would be the first one to tell you. I just missed the throw, unfortunately, but that's what pressure does. When you get quarterbacks that can't throw and set their feet, they tend to lose their accuracy. You know, in that case, they're crossing route there. Just missed by half a second. Instead, it's six the other way, as they like to say, and with 46 seconds left, any hope that Pine Bluff had of winning this football game has evaporated and the fans starting to check out of Golden Lion Stadium. And don't forget Sports Center U following the game. Prairie View to kick off here and they have scored all 21 of their points here in the second half. Whatever Henry Frazier told them at halftime, whether it was CEO talk or maybe good old fashioned locker room talk, it worked. Yes, it did work, and you know, and they could have scored more points. I'm sure he's going to go coach them up about the missed opportunities they had when it comes to fumbling the ball on their one yard line going in. Had another fumble when they crossed midfield, so sloppily played game offensively for Prairie View, but they just managed to do enough just not to beat themselves and to go out here and get the victory this evening. With the win, Prairie View would even its record on the season. They'd get to 503 and three, and they'd go to three and two in the swack and it's a reality they probably didn't want to think about but if they lost this game any hope they had of defending their swack title was probably out the window so Prairie View will continue and I think you know for them unfortunately they got to watch they need some help they need some teams to give them a hand you know, that loss to Graham really set them back so Graham's a team that beats we talked to earlier in the game during the game you know, they're on top but I think the key matchup is going to be is uh, that Texas Southern Grambling game at the end of the year could be for a swag title if Texas Southern can start to win out and Prairie View got a chance to go eight and three winning the rest of your game so that's something you got to take pride in Dwayne Chappelle Got to Boudreaux in the backfield there, and that looks like the last play that we're going to see here at Golden Lion Stadium. Prairie View A&M, they've been on the road quite a bit this season. They spoil the home opener for Arkansas Pine Bluff. Henry Frazier's Panthers, thanks to 21 points in the second half, knock off the Golden Lions of Arkansas Pine Bluff, 21-6 to the final. Yeah, that was a tough one there. I mean, one of those games where I think both defenses put A-plus effort, but unfortunately for Arkansas Pine Bluff, the home team, they couldn't get it done when they needed the offense to produce. For Jay Walker and Charlie Neal down on the field, I'm Anish Shroff. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. 21-6 Prairie View 
Let's go to the studio now with Lowell and Charles. This is SportsCenter U.